Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to make sure that you guys can hear us. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So we'd like, like to welcome you this morning to our Zoom world, thanks to COVID. Um, hopefully this works through. Um, we'd like to go ahead and start with the presentations after some introductions, um, some home um, housekeeping rules. If you have any questions, you can either, I don't know if there's a hand there that you can show or you can put it in the chat and then um, Dr. Ibana or one of us who's not speaking will keep a log of them and we'll try to get to it at the end. We actually have a Q&A session, which is at the very end, um, and we should be able to answer um, questions. But please do um, feel free to let us know if you have some questions specifically regarding a slide. Um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce myself. My, um, I'm Dr. Deepa Iyengar. I'm a family doc. Um, been practicing for the last 25 years. Um, I'm at McGovern, the UT Medical School in Houston. And um, I, am, I did my master's in public health with interest in global health. I grew up in India and did my uh, medical schooling in Hyderabad in India. And so that was one of my interests when um, I immigrated to the United States was to be able to see what I could do on the global platform. Um, so uh, the last 10 years, um, we've been doing different projects in Houston related to South Asians, diabetes, obesity, but also got involved very um, actively with medical students, residents. And now we have a center called the Global Health Center that I co-direct with Dr. Ibana, who's my other speaker on the call. And we also take care of the global health concentration in, uh, at the school. So we're very happy to have you guys join us and hopefully it'll be a very interactive and uh, a good session moving forward. So with that, I'll pass the mic on to uh, Dr. Jami or Dr. Shailendra and then I'll ask uh, Dr. Ivana to end the introductions and then we maybe can have a few minutes to talk about some of the um, participants so we can understand where you are coming from and uh, then we can start our um, sessions. Does that seem reasonable? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, either Dr. Jami or um, Dr. Shailendra, do you want to talk a little bit about your uh, positions and um, your role in this project? Yeah. No, I'll... I'll, I'll um... I'll jump in, probably, uh, you know, putting up, putting off my uh, video right now because I want to conserve the bandwidth. But yeah, I am Dr. Jami. I work for Share India, which is uh, Society for Health Advanced Research, uh, Allied Assess Research uh, Education. Uh, I basically head the research wing in this organization. Uh, I am in. Uh, I, I have done an MD in community medicine, and I also have completed my uh, PhD in epidemiology from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I have been working in the field of public health, specifically, I would say, uh, in implementation of public health programs in the country, especially in India. Uh, of late, over the last five to six years, I have uh, got into uh, mostly the research side of it. Most of my research is on infectious diseases and interface between the infectious diseases and the non-communicable non diseases. Uh, we do have different type of work that we do at Share India, which I will present it as a part of the uh, presentation as we move along. Uh, I thank the organizers and uh, everyone else for this opportunity to interact with you all. I look forward for the interactions and also look forward for presenting the work that we do so that I can get some feedback on that front also. Thank you and look forward for the interactions. Over to you, Dr. Shailendra. Thanks, Dr. Ayengar and Dr. Jami. So this is uh, Shailendra. I am a medical doctor with an MD in pharmacology. 
I have also attended public health uh, research training at uh, Emory University, University of Pittsburgh, and Johns Hopkins. My area of interest is primarily cardiometabolic disease prevention and control. And currently, I am principal investigator for a M Health study that's looking at uh, prevention and treatment of both hypertension and diabetes over a long term to reduce the adverse consequences of both. And that is what I will be presenting as we uh, go deeper into the conference today. So that's the brief introduction from me. And I think uh, now we'll start with the proceedings of the conference. So Dr. Jemmy, would you go? Dr. Ibana, the... do you want to say something about yourself? And then yeah, we sorry. can... Yeah, sorry, no problems. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be brief. I'm just here to support my colleagues. I'm Dr. Ibano. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at McGovern. I work with Dr. Anger leading global health education efforts, and my other area of uh, practice in, in global health relates to tuberculosis research in Eastern Europe and, and, and South America. So one of the interesting things that worked out was that Dr. Ibana actually went to Hyderabad to attend a tuberculosis conference, which is really interesting because she, that she went to Hyderabad and that's the city that I actually grew up and did my medical school. And so it just worked out that her conference landed up being in Hyderabad. So she actually has seen Hyderabad. All right, um, do we wanna take a minute so that we can just, um, See, we have a few um, participants, since there are not many, just can you all give us just a brief intro onto you all and what your interests are, if that's okay? Because I don't think we, we have a few of them, so. So my name is um, Dr. Jindal. I'm in Washington, DC. I'm a professor of surgery at Uniform Services University. Um, I'm originally from Ahmedabad, Gujarat, and <clears throat> I've been in the U.S. now for 35 years. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at the Indian Institute of Public Health in Gandhinagar, that is India's first university uh, devoted to public health. Um, and I was a Fulbright Distinguished Chair three years ago, and then again this year, and um, what I'm researching and doing a lot of work is on surgical unmet need in India. We have a series of publications um, ongoing with uh, numerous MPH students in India at Gandhinagar. Um, okay. And we have um, um, recently extended our work to tribal areas in India, looking at surgical unmet need um, and why people are not utilizing the universally free healthcare system, which is basically Modi care, uh, and for which we are using telecommunication and internet and so on to reach the tribal areas. So, exciting! Thank you for sharing that. All right? Does anybody want to go next? Hi, my name is Emily Clark, and I'm a student at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., I'm getting my master's in public health in global health. And I've spent a little bit of time in India, and I'm just interested in technology for global health and advancing different efforts that way. Um, so I'm excited to hear what you all are doing. Wonderful. Welcome, Emily. Hi everybody, this is Jeremy Schwartz. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Yale School of Medicine in New Haven, Connecticut in the United States. Um, my uh, long-term engagement in Uganda has uh, led to um, some really interesting global uh, mobile health work over the past couple of years. We have an NIH funded study ongoing around um, using a mobile health uh, intervention to improve self-care among patients with heart failure. Really excited to hear what you guys have to present today. Wonderful. Thank you. I can go next. Hi, everybody. My name is Wo Min, and I'm a Dr. PH student at 
School of Public Health, um, my concentration is health promotion and community health sciences. So I think this section is really um, valuable for me because mobile health and technology are really critical in health promotion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gilbert Harding. I'm a doctoral student in the, at Texas Tech at University of Health Science Center School of Nursing. I'm in the uh, doctoral of, um, in the uh, 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 program. And my interest today is uh, mostly with the public um, policy aspect and health equity. And so that's, and so uh, I'm here to see if I can uh, garner any uh, information in that regard. Wonderful, thanks Gilbert. Good morning, this is, I'm Vidya Vedam. I'm a program officer at the Center for Global Health National Cancer Institute. I manage the funding of the Global Mobile Health Networks, uh, Mobile Health Technology Program for the Center for Global Health and for NCI. Um, and so obviously I'm interested in this space. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is, oh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh -huh. Hello. Yes. Okay, my name is, my name is Yesunde John Akiola. I'm a, an assistant professor and also a researcher in health promotion and public health at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. I work on cervical cancer prevention, and we are currently writing a proposal on using mobile health for the uptake of HPV vaccination among school children. So I'm really interested in learning from what has been done in India. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Jessica. I am a software trainer. I work in the health tech space. Um, I'm also an MD, although I've used um, my MD not to practice, but to work uh, on, on global health projects. Uh, so really excited to see what you guys are doing. Wonderful. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, my name is Scott Rowley. I am a nurse practitioner in oncology at The Ohio State University, also a doctoral nursing student. And my work is looking at um, using telehealth and mobile health to expand our access to Appalachian, Ohio um, and the Appalachian United States for cancer care. Wonderful, thank you, welcome. Thank you. Happy come through everybody, I guess. Hi so there. I, yeah? Yeah, um, I'll just oh. say hello. Uh, my name is Marty Bronk and uh, I'm a surgeon at Stanford in California. Um, I've had uh, various experiences in the developing world and in surgery in the past. And uh, at this later aspect of my career, I'm interested in exploring what I might do to work on mobile health issues related to surgery. So I'm excited. Wonderful. People are Thank doing. you. And then I'm just going to read out one of, um, I think it's Dr. Valerie Fields, who's here, and she is um, an MD practicing pathology, specifically cytopathology out at Quest Diagnosis in North Carolina. And she's done some voluntary work in Tamil Nadu with introduction to pap smear screening and training cytoscreeners. So that's what her um, interests are, and that's what brought her to the uh, meeting today. Um, if we finished introductions, I'm going to turn over the um, screen to Dr. Jami and um, Shailendra to do their portion of their um, session, and uh, we'll get started. Dr. Jami, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that as a part of the format, I will make the presentation, and Deepa, if you can just show up the video when I ask you to do that. Perfect, I'll uh, do that. And... Uh, I'm just stopping the video and I'm going for the screen share.
I hope you can, uh, you know, see the slide. Yes. Uh, the format is, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the organization and the work that we do, uh, which basically forms the foundation of the M health related work that, you know, Dr. Shailendra is going to present after this. I'm also going to give you a, a overall sort of overview in terms of the work that we are doing so that you can also ask some specific questions related to some of the areas of your interest. So at, at Share India, we do a lot of community-based research and most of our research is community-based because we are located in the outskirts of Hyderabad and we work with around uh, 40 villages of around 50,000 population. So when you talk about Share India, we basically have a share USA, which is, uh, you know, formed by various medical practitioners who uh, did their medicine from India, but then re uh, moved to the United States and then started practicing there and were in successful positions in the United States. They wanted to give back to India. So they started Share India, which is a research foundation. And parallel to that, they also started a shared medical care, which is basically education and services oriented organization, which in turn uh, started a medical school called as Medicity Institute of Medical Sciences in the outskirts of Hyderabad. So when you look at the organization, we have uh, a research foundation and we have a medical school and we are based out from the campus of the medical school itself so that there is a lot of this interaction between the medical school and the research uh, within the same campus and the work that we do. So Share India was formed uh, uh, in 1986. It is called the, the, you know, the full form of Share is Society for Health Allied Research and Education. And it is also recognized as a scientific and industrial research organization by Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India. So as I initially just quickly mentioned, we have something called as a rural effective, affordable, comprehensive healthcare, which we call it as REACH. And this basically is a, a sort of motherboard for all of our projects. Uh, it's basically a dynamic population-based geocoded database of around 50,000 population living in 40 villages. It's basically a proactive healthcare delivery system. And we call it proactive healthcare delivery system because this was initiated around two and a half decades back, specifically to look at you know, immunizations and also in terms of uh, institutional deliveries. The immunization and institutional deliveries were critical at that point in time in the late 90s and early 2000s because the immunization levels were pretty low. And also institutional deliveries were not that, not, not all the 100% were institutional deliveries. We still had a lot of home deliveries happening. So we moved ahead and we said that we will work on a proactive basis with the community, uh, specifically to improve the nutrition and health of women and children, looking at pregnant women, immunization, and also family planning. At this point in time, I would like to mention, especially regarding family planning, in India, there is a, a preponderance of sterilization, especially female sterilization as a family planning uh, method, rather than uh, any barrier or temporary sterilization methods. And any woman who has two children uh, is generally encouraged to go ahead and get a sterilization done. So we focused on family planning, immunization and women care at that point in time. So what we did was we worked with the local communities and identified uh, community volunteers who would basically, we, we put around uh, one community health volunteer for every 1,000, 1,500 population, which in turn is currently now similar to ASHA workers, which is again accredited social health activists from the government of India, uh, which is again one health worker for every 1,000 population. So what we did was much earlier than Asha's, we introduced this community health volunteer concept. And these uh, women basically are from the community and they know, this, the, they know the village and they know the people within their own village. So it was easier for them to discuss concepts related to health and also uh, you know, encourage them to access health. 
and as i was mentioning we take this reach as a motherboard of uh, all our population based research projects in share so when i talk about the geocoding you know this is uh, you know this was done you know almost close to 18 19 years back when we started this geocoding and things have improved a bit but i'll take you through the process in terms of how we were able to do this geocoding so google earth images or you know google images were taken up so this is one of the villages that i'm uh, you know which is shown here which basically is a google map of that particular village with whatever resolution and uh, the precision that you can get so once we have that image what we do is we do something called as transect walks and you know uh, social walks across the village and then we take this map from the google earth or the google maps and then we start you know drawing things specifically in terms of houses or you know in terms of any other uh, social uh, related uh, uh, places like temples or mosques and things like that and we also try to mark some of the other things which are not existing in the maps because sometimes maps uh, are a bit older and newer structures don't uh, you know are not shown in the map so we also add those structures apart from that we also add in terms of any uh, uh, stores or any shops or any other uh, structures like uh, water tanks or you know uh, hostels etc and we try to map them up once this is mapped then we sort of take off the underlying uh, you know the google map and then make a whole uh, map specifically of that village where we have we can, we then uh, start integrating that data with the household data like for example all the green light green color uh, you know boxes are basically houses with uh, you know asbestos sheet as their roof and the blue ones are with uh, rcc or you know you can call it as uh, cement based roofs and the pinkish one are tiled roofs and uh, if there is any yellow ones they are huts which is like uh, uh, very informally done by some of the leaves and branches of trees so we try to map that up on the map so that we are aware in terms of which type of household we are looking at and this particular map then becomes our sort of uh, uh, map for that village apart from that what we do is we then send our gs person or our uh, uh, one of the uh, staff from share india to each of these houses and then for each of these houses then we collect the coordinates both the lats and longs based on the houses that they uh, uh, all the houses they visit and then uh, may, note down the lats and longs for the household so that we have the geographical coordinates also so deepa if you can just show reach video here because that would give a good idea in terms of the not not just about the geocoded cohort but overall intention in terms of how the reach moved ahead over to you deepa if you can just okay. uh, show so do you let me see okay let me Can you all hear it? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go back on mute and everything. In the present system, that there is no tracking of those who are not being served. We may know as a mass scale and say 50% are not served. but we don't know individually who is not served but if we can go down to the very grassroots level and identify each individual in a timely fashion who is not served and make the local functionaries and their immediate supervisors aware of it then i think that most of the people will be served reach the rural effective affordable comprehensive healthcare is the motherboard for all our uh, service and research projects and the basic strategy is 
count every individual and therefore counting leads to accountability, accountability leads to efficacy. The REACH project initially started with one village and uh, then slowly expanded to all the villages of Merchal Mandal, excluding the Merchal town. So it consists of 40 villages and about 50,000 population and 10,000 households. First, what we do is we take a picture of a Google Earth and we place it in the ArcGIS and superimpose the houses on each and every existing house which is there in the Google Earth. And we'll take the printout and go to the village and cross-check with the drawn map. If there is any existing house which is will not identify the Google Earth, we take that with the GPS coordinator device which is having with us and then place it in the ArcGIS. One uh, important uh, uh, manpower for this particular project is a community health volunteer uh, based in the respective villages, one per every thousand population. The basic uh, uh, approach is the community health volunteers identify uh, women who, who become pregnant during antenatal care, they, are, they receive uh, a TT injection. Uh, and subsequently, uh, when the birth takes place, the data about uh, the infant, the sex, whether it's like, I mean, where was it born, etc. All this information is collected. Every morning on Thursday, 11 o'clock, the meeting is conducted in the community room with the coordinator and health supervisors. The data is handed over to the health supervisors. They will cross-check the data and give it to the coordinator. And he will edit the uh, data and hand it over to the data entry operator. And the data entry operator enters the data. If she finds or he finds any problem, he will again return it back to the coordinator. The alert uh, report will be provided that tells you uh, which uh, household the child is uh, immunized, not immunized. These are immunizations. Once you have it, you know, they give this to the CHU, and CHU will go and inform that to PSC, concerned PSC or subcenter, and this is the household where this particular child due for immunization, they have to be immunized. So once you inform those things, the concerned health functionary, they do the immunization. When it is not done for about uh, three weeks or so, then the particular child is not immunized, we take the vaccine from here, However, the car, eh, they don't give immunization. Then inform the government people that you are immunized. Because uh, they also are given permission to you know, give vaccine. First of all, there was no doctor in the hospital. Now, there was a doctor who was given the injection, and there was a doctor who was given the injection. There was a doctor who was given the doctor who was given the injection. I think the most tangible effect is that almost uh, the vaccine preventable diseases are unheard of in this area. And two, I think it had some impact on the infant mortality rate that uh, the rural Andhra being around 55 and we have about 40. And three, even if you look at the under five mortalities, even more uh, uh, impact because uh, there is a significant drop in the one to five mortality because of the vaccinations. So there you see much bigger impact. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Deepa. I think there were some issues. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for being patient on that. Uh, I just wanted to show you this video which might actually give you a feel in terms of how the things happen. I'll go back to the presentation. Just give me a minute. I'm just sharing the screen now. Uh, yeah. So this was about reach. You know, basically the 
geocoded database which we are following up for the past two decades, specifically in terms of immunization, maternal health, and also in terms of family planning. What we do in this database is every two weeks, we ensure that we have uh, the information coming from each household if there has been any vital event. When I say vital event, vital event in terms of births, we already get the information. However, if there is a vital event in terms of death, in terms of migration, in migration specifically, which happens in this part of the country is after marriage, the daughter-in-law comes to the house or after marriage, the daughter goes out of that house. So you know, getting that information is also critical. So every uh, two weeks we have, uh, we follow up and we get the information from each household so that the, the database is updated every two weeks. Now this particular database is very critical because we are at any point in time with the surety of the last two weeks, we are very clear in terms of what is the population residing in each household, which is geocoded. Based on these, uh, this motherboard of reach, we have done various projects. So I'll just sort of quickly go, uh, take you through in terms of these projects. The Longitudinal Indian Family Health Study. This particular uh, study was based out of the, uh, one of the studies which was planned in United States, the National Children's Study, for which I think they even had a congressional uh, approval of more than I think $2 billion or something for the study. However, uh, that study couldn't be kicked off in the United States for various reasons, but we took that as one of the idea or a concept and replicated here. In this study, what we have done is we have enrolled couples, especially couples who are planning for a child. So we have enrolled pre-pregnant women, follow them up in the pre-pregnancy period, and during the pregnancy, we again follow them up in the first and third trimester. And post-pregnancy, we follow them up further in terms of delivery and also the child outcomes. So the eldest child is now almost close to eight to nine years in this cohort. We have enrolled around 1,227 women uh, from this particular region itself. The overall objectives were to assess the effect of prenatal and also pregnancy-related factors uh, on the pregnancy outcomes, childbirth, and child development. The current uh, uh, the intent of this cohort is to follow up the children at least for another 10 years or, or, or till the child is 18 years old to see in terms of what are the factors from pre-pregnancy to pregnancy and how do they impact the child development and uh, child health. Under the LIFE project, under this longitudinal health and family health study, what we have done is we also have uh, stored a lot of biospecimens, like we stored a uh, buffy coat and plasma of the mothers. And then uh, during various stages in pre-pregnancy, early first trimester, and also in the third trimester, we also have stored uh, cord blood, placenta, we have, uh, the, we have breast milk, we have vaginal swabs, we also have taken stool samples of uh, children and blood samples from children. So there are close to around 100,000 specimens, biospecimens available in this particular cohort. So as a part of this biospecimens, we did a one ancillary study in terms of looking at mycoplasma and uroplasma species and how do they impact the uh, pregnancy outcomes. This was one of the uh, NIH uh, R21s that we had worked with. Uh, we got funding along with the University of Pittsburgh. There's another uh, study or a cohort called Healthy Pregnancy or HELP study. This is uh, based out of the medical college, which is in the campus itself. And uh, here, what we are doing is we are trying to look at markers, uh, which uh, are associated or which uh, are associated with uh, hypertensive disorders. And in this study, what we do is we look at uh, we uh, look at pregnant women who come to the medical college gynecology and obstetrics department. 
we recruit women who are less than 14 weeks in their pregnancy and after that every month we do measure their blood pressures and also collect and store their blood samples so we have every month blood samples and every month blood uh, pressures uh, collected for these women for a period of uh, seven to eight months throughout their pregnancy so we have anywhere between five to nine visits of uh, of women who give their samples during this particular study and we are currently doing a cohort paper on this particular uh, help study we had initiated a cohort of geriatric population population is more than 60 years we took up 562 men and women uh, from this region again the database was very helpful especially reach database was very helpful because we had a line list of every uh, person who was more than 60 years and we had the gender differentiation also so we were able to do a random sampling and pick up the people from this the objective of this study was to look at the various prevalence of various uh, age related chronic diseases and also disability and my phd was on this study especially looking at uh, uh, bone density and disability associations we recently concluded a study wherein we looked at uh, surgical site infections among caesarean sections uh, one of the things that i'm sure many of you would have observed or read or seen uh, in uh, news articles that in india caesarean sections are of a high proportion especially in andhra pradesh and telangana states the caesarean sections constitute almost close to 40 to 50 percent tamil nadu including uh, so as a part of this we wanted to see in terms of so many caesarean sections are happening so what's the occurrence of surgical site infection so as a part of this study we recruited 2000 caesarean sections within the medical college hospital within our campus we followed them up for 28 days of four weeks of follow up uh, for occurrence of surgical site infection and uh, we just concluded the study and we are also we are in the process of uh, the manuscript writing for this the recent COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sure all of us have been really impacted by that. If not, we would have been talking in person in this particular conference. So as a part of the work towards COVID-19, uh, we initiated a serial a zero surveillance of COVID-19. Uh, along with COVID-19, because dengue and chikungunya are almost, I would say, endemic, or you know, they become epidemic in certain seasons. We wanted to look at the zero surveillance of these three particular viral diseases. But for the COVID-19, we are looking at around 5,000 participants and we are going to uh, look at their uh, zero prevalence four times over a period of year in the months of zero, four, eight, and 12 months. And dengue and chikungunya, we're going to look at zero and 12 months. So this is another study which we are doing it in this 50,000 population of the REACH database itself. So these are some of the projects that are based out of the REACH cohort or the REACH uh, database that I was mentioning, which is the motherboard for the activities, many of the activities that we do at Share India. We also do, as I was mentioning, we also do other public health implementation and other uh, research related activities. Uh, one of the key things that we do in our organization is we work with uh, the government of India and provide technical assistance in various areas like HIV and TB care. We also work in the lab space for providing technical assistance to the government. Specifically, we are working on providing assistance for strengthening laboratory uh, processes and procedures for HIV related care, especially viral loads and uh, CD4 testing. We work in the space of infection prevention control and antimicrobial resistance. We are also working in the space of uh, strengthening the surveillance system uh, this has recently come in with the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, the timely grant that we have received from Centers for Disease Control Atlanta. We're trying to strengthen the surveillance systems, especially in few select states. We are also part of a consortium for testing uh, lab on wheels for chlamydia. And uh, we are also one of the lead uh, consortium members for big data analytics on epidemiological data sets in India for which we are contributing uh, data sets from REACH, 
life study and also the mice, the geriatric study. So these are some of the other projects that we are doing. I just wanted to give an overall sort of uh, uh, scope of the work that we are currently doing in our uh, organization. This uh, technology enabled community health workers extending telemedicine to rural homes at affordable cost, which we also call it as Tetra, is one of the key M health related initiative over the last four to five years that we have taken. And I would request uh, Dr. Shailendra to take it over from here to explain in detail about this project. If there are any questions I'm willing to take, uh, however, I think uh, we can take it up at a later point as uh, Dr. Deepa was mentioning. Over to you, Dr. Shailendra. So Dr. Jamie, I have a question for you. Do you want to see if anybody has any questions for this part of it that you did, or do you want to wait till the very end? Uh, I'm, I'm open, Dr. Deepa. Okay. Um, why I don't we a, do... Uh -huh, I, have a, I have a question. Um, the work we are doing in Gujarat, the government has already mapped every village in a population of 65 million. And you have the demographics, the age, um, education, religion, everything. So it makes our work easy. And number two is, have you, you mentioned ASHA workers and we work with them because they're very motivated and <clears throat> they get fee for service. And probably we should engage them more because some of the work you're doing overlaps with the ASHA workers or the Angarwadi workers in, at least in Gujarat? No, we, what we have done is that's a very apt question, uh, Dr. Rahul, uh, Dr. Jindal, but what I would like to put forth is that we have tried to ensure that there is no duplication. We ensure, we only count those people who don't get service. Our intention is to reach out to the people who have not received the service and then link them up with the ASHA workers, a &Ms, and the Anganwadi workers for their services. So we don't directly provide service. We ensure that everybody receives services and we facilitate that part of it. So I agree that you know we uh, ASHAs are really very critical in the current uh, health systems uh, and we work very closely with them. And we only facilitate and help them do their work more efficiently by providing them the information. The second part, especially in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the Gujarat uh, mapping the complete uh, sort of 65 million population that you're mentioning. If that has been done, that is fantastic. However, if you look at uh, uh, the minute details in terms of household level mapping, and we call this as socio-demographic sites, especially in this country, we have only, as far as I, rem I am aware, around eight to 10 social demographic sites, which are uh, having minute details in terms of uh, geocoding and also the household composition, which is uh, updated. So the information of the 65 million, if it is there in Gujarat, that is fantastic if it is there. But I'm sure, uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of that, but if it is there, then I think uh, that's a great thing for Gujarat to move ahead. It's on the internet. All you have to do is to Google Gujarat census and uh, all this will show up, um, including Google maps and, and very uh, focused minute information on every village. So- uh, No, I agree was, because- if you Dr. Rahul, uh, if you are mentioning about the census, we have it for all the states. We have it for all the states and all the uh, you know complete country. And there is information, as you rightly said, in terms of the village-wise, district-wise, sub-district-wise, that information is available, no doubts about it. But the only problem is in the village level, it only tells that you have 1,500 as a population. It gives you some description, uh, some... Uh, it gives you details about the gender distribution, some age category-wise distribution, and also in terms of uh, socio-demographic variables. But this information is done every 10 years once. And the updation of it is something that you know uh, is not done within the 10 years. And when you actually implement projects or implement interventions related to public health, uh, more recent information is what would be critical for planning. 
So that's the only reason why we went ahead and did this uh, thing. And I think we are one of the few people in this country right now having this uh, up-to-date uh, social demographic site. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jamie, there's another question in the chat about what software do you use to connect, to collect and analyze your data? Uh, the software is, uh, it's basically SQL at the back end and Visual Basic at the front end. And uh, most of the data is collected on paper-based formats because the community health volunteers are not much savvy at this point in time uh, in terms of doing a lot of data collection through a digital platform, which, but we do have experience now with Tetra project that they are capable of doing it. We have not a transition to electrical data collection, electronic data collection, but the whole data collection is done by a paper-based system, which is entered by data entry operators in our office. So it's visual basic front end, SQL back end. And I agree with Valerie when she says that Asha workers in Silchar, she has worked they were amazing. I think, you know, Valerie, whenever you are in India, please do come to Hyderabad and reach out to us at SHARE. Uh, Asha workers across this country are really amazing. And in fact, there are so many great case studies that we have of them uh, in our locality that we work and also many other localities across this country. They have been, actually they have lived up to the title, you know, accredited social health activists. Um, I'm, I'm, I, um, I, I think, yes, I, I do agree with you. They are amazing. Thank you. I have another question, a political question. Um, sure. The government of India doesn't like uh, funds coming from other countries, especially the US, because they are tied to ideology, religion, all sorts of things. So when will your project become self-sufficient? Like it's almost 10 years you have been doing this. When will you cut off the ties to US-based doctors? Because that's what the ultimate aim is for all projects. Yeah, the, if you look at the projects that I presented, REACH is self-funded. The LIFE cohort is self-funded. But what we are actually having in terms of United States government funding is through the CDC, Centers for Disease Control funding, which is coming from since 2005. And we have not faced much of an issue in that front. Specifically to tell you honestly, we have had, you know, five, five year fundings from CDC. We have had, uh, two five-year funding from NIH, and we had smaller R21s, around two of them from NIH, which is from United States, and we never had any issues on that front. I don't think there has been uh, any issue at, at our organization specifically related to foreign funding. Uh, probably the processes that we follow and the things that we follow did not uh, you know, impact us at any point in time at this Till now, that much I can say. Thank you. All right. Um, so since we have had a couple of questions, can we step to the next one with Dr. Shailendra? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. So just give me a second. I'll just share my screen. So I hope you are able to see my screen shared with you all. Yes. Yeah. So good morning to you all again. And uh, taking on from where Dr. Jami left you all with the TETRA project, uh, which is an acronym for technology enabled community health workers extending telemedicine to rural homes at affordable costs. So the image here in the inset actually is the uh, health workers visiting a household in a rural community, the rural community where we have all of our projects running in the 40 villages of Maitchell with 50,000 population in India. 
So this Tetra project specifically focuses on hypertension and diabetes control. And why only hypertension and diabetes? Basically, we saw that uh, with uh, the intervention that we have been doing in the 50,000 villages, especially focused on maternal and child health, we were able to achieve a reasonably good target of immunizing the pregnant women and immunizing children. In fact, more than 95% target was achieved. And then we saw that the silent epidemic of cardiovascular disease has been sweeping the country. And the distinction between the urban and rural divides is gradually disappearing. And the urban population with increasing socio-demographic transition is becoming more vulnerable to the risk of hypertension, diabetes, and their consequences as much as their urban counterparts. And we thought that in addition to the focus that we have on maternal and child health, which are the old world problems, we need to also focus on the new world problems of socio-demographic transition in terms of the hypertension, diabetes, and the consequences of those in terms of the massive burden to life and economy of the individuals, families, and the nation also. Cardiovascular disease has now replaced most other conditions in India as the leading cause of death. And hypertension, diabetes are the two key drivers for this epidemic of cardiovascular diseases. Just to give a sense in terms of numbers, every third Indian is hypertensive and every 10th has diabetes. Unfortunately, only a 10th of the rural and a fifth of the urban Indian hypertensives had their blood pressure under control. Every stark reality and has potential implications for, again, the individuals, the family, and the nation, because hypertension uncontrolled can contribute significantly to morbidity and mortality. Again, to just look at some numbers, uncontrolled blood pressure could lead to 50% of heart failures. It could lead to close to 50% of strokes, crippling and sometimes life-threatening, and also affecting productivity significantly. And nearly 20% of the heart attacks or the myocardial infarctions are attributed directly to hypertension. So just taking care of hypertension, which seemingly is a low hanging fruit and easy to detect and put people on treatment and follow up seems to translate into reductions significantly in preventing heart failures, about half of them, myocardial infarctions, at least a fifth of them, and strokes again, a half of them. So significant impact with a low hanging fruit for blood pressure detection and treatment, translating into benefits for the community and the nation is what prompted us to choose hypertension as one of the targets for our control. The other one, the twin brother of hypertension, I say the twin brother because nearly 30% of the people with hypertension have diabetes and a whopping 70% of people with diabetes have hypertension. So it would be very pragmatic to target both because when we target people with hypertension, we often end up people who have diabetes also, and it may not be ethical for us to say we treat only hypertension for diabetes, go elsewhere. And similarly, when we treat people with diabetes, identify people with diabetes, it will be improper for us to say we treat only diabetes for hypertension, go elsewhere. So we said that these are the two low hanging fruits and two key drivers of cardiovascular disease epidemic and have tremendous potential in making life better for the individuals, the families, and also overall for the nation's well-being. And this is what prompted us to choose hypertension and diabetes as the focus of our research by using technology. What does this technology do? The, we saw that only a small fraction of the people with hypertension and a fraction of people with diabetes have their blood pressure, blood sugar respectively under control. We looked up what are the barriers to the effective control of hypertension and diabetes. And from a scoping review of literature, we saw that the four A's, awareness, availability, accessibility, and affordability of healthcare were responsible for poor control of hypertension and diabetes. Hypertension and diabetes, we all know, chronic, insidious, slowly developing, progressive, and until late, people don't realize that they have hypertension and diabetes and end up with consequences like heart attacks, that is myocardial infarction, strokes, and heart failures. So lack of awareness, especially in a rural population, is a big factor that contributes to these diseases passing off silently until they pass, uh, then result in catastrophic consequences. So picking up early, creating awareness is an important aspect of hypertension and diabetes control over and above detecting and treating people with hypertension and diabetes. Additionally, lack of coordinated healthcare 
because hypertension and diabetes are problems for the life, at least as we see them today, though there is emerging evidence that we can reverse it, but by and large, we consider them to be diseases for the life. Now, if such type of condition requires continuous ongoing support and treatment over a period of time, and that system is well-oiled machinery to do that over a longitudinal period of time is currently lacking, at least in the Indian context, and probably many LMIC and uh, underserved populations even in the advanced countries. The other thing is being chronic conditions, people generally have a fatigue to medicines and the lifestyle interventions. So people may not be really enthusiastic and keen down the line after a few years, and they may not stick to medications, and they may just have the blood pressures and blood sugars again, gradually trickling down towards worse. Finally, the direct and indirect costs, especially in an underserved resource poor setting, people need to spend money. In India, we don't have any big major health insurance applicable all over India. Of course, the Ayushman Bharat, as one of our colleagues was mentioning, is there in some states. But by and large, for conditions like hypertension and diabetes, for their management, visiting the hospital and getting treatment is really most of out-of-pocket expenditure, even if not directly, indirectly, because the person will have to lose wages on that particular day to visit the hospital. So we thought that this awareness being poor, the availability of healthcare being only sparse and not really well coordinated and available to handle the longitudinal nature of these problems, and also preventing the people from accessing healthcare because of a whole lot of socioeconomic reasons are the factors triggering the poor control for hypertension and diabetes. And what we thought was a non-physician health worker, as we all agreed, and there were a lot of comments that were posted in favor of the ASHAs, the accredited social health activists, and whoever has experience of working with them, you know, immediately, instantly connect, and I agree with the idea that they are exceptionally good in the work that they do. They are ambassadors for cheer in their own villages. And I would like to make a point here that the accredited social health activists were actually formally incorporated into the healthcare system of India under the National Rural Health Mission in the year 2005. But way before that, at least a decade before that, uh, you heard our chairman, Dr. P.S. Reddy, mentioning the idea of a health worker embedded in the village to facilitate the health-related activities in that village so that people own up the healthcare that is provided to them. We had conceived the community health worker or community health volunteer concept a decade in advance of the ASHA that was uh, incorporated into the healthcare system by the government authorities in India. In fact, most of the individuals that we have appointed as community health volunteers ended up being the ASHAs for the government and they are continuing to do the excellent work. So what we thought was these non-physician health workers, the community health workers, the ASHAs could be facilitators for enhancing community participation in the projects that we take up they can be important ambassadors for creating awareness and motivating people to adopt healthy lifestyles and also to ensure adherence to medication. More importantly, they could be the critical bridge to enhance the utilization of healthcare services. People may or may not be really fully aware of the resources available to help them have access to healthcare. And the health workers like non-physician health workers, the community health volunteers can bridge that gap in communication and help the hospital services be optimally utilized by these people. Finally, they could be leveraged by using technology, as we will go in a bit, to deliver low-cost healthcare at the doorsteps of beneficiaries. In fact, this concept of delivering healthcare at the doorsteps of beneficiaries is the brainchild of the founder of our organization, Dr. P.S. Reddy. He says, you justify me and give me 10 reasons to say why the patient should go to the hospital. He says, uh, there are many conditions that you could just treat even without the patient going to the hospital. And in India, we have a reasonably low doctor population ratio. Even now, if we say that the doctor population ratio is far better than what it used to be 50 years ago, still the argument is it's a skewed doctor pa patient ratio. Most of our doctors are concentrated in the urban areas and doesn't look very encouraging that in the near future, they're any time going to go to the rural areas to serve. So given a lot of problems with the rural situation in India, most doctors would prefer staying back in the cities and work than to go to the villages. So making laws and forcing people may not really be a good idea. So how do we extend the arms of the physician, the physicians that are sitting in the cities, how do we extend their arms and make them reach out to the people? Probably the extended arm of the physicians could be these non-physician health workers. And that is what is uh, the basis for conceiving this whole concept 
of the community health workers bridging the community and health facility. And it's a two way communication. People can go to the health worker, health worker will go to the people and then uh, build their trust and uh, rapport and facilitate their access to the healthcare. And on the other hand, whatever is happening in the healthcare system, which needs to be disseminated to the people and involve them and make them more active participants in seeking healthcare that is available to them as a right can be a work of community health worker. So community health worker essentially bridges the gap between the needs of the community and the services that are on offer through the various agencies of the government. And this is what made us conceive the Tetra intervention strategy. In fact, just to give a background of how did this Tetra intervention strategy come up, we organized a research summit lasting about two days way back in 2013, early 2013. And the um, it was collaborative effort between the Public Health Foundation of India, the Center for Chronic Disease Control India, and a couple of universities in the US, like the Global Diabetes Research Center, Emory, then the School of Public Health, University of Pittsburgh. And we had few representatives from uh, Chicago and uh, also from the Northwestern University. And we had 60 leading cardiovascular researchers from all over India. And one of the important questions that came up as a part of the brainstorming was, can we develop and demonstrate a model for leveraging technology to deliver care for hypertension and diabetes in an effective and cost-effective manner? So I happened to be a participant in that meeting. And after that meeting, I was uh, asked if I could write up a concept note and submit it to the government of India, which I did. We got a uh, concept note approved. We got the full proposal also approved, but then the funding got significantly delayed. But our organization had tremendous amount of uh, uh, enthusiasm and positivity about this concept of leveraging technology and enabling health workers and sending them to serve people at the doorsteps for hypertension and diabetes control. And that is how we conceived this idea. And with some of our internal funding, we started off. I was fortunate to get a small grant from the NIH to do a pilot study, and this study kicked off. So we can see in the image here, there is a health worker. She has a bag. She has a tablet in her hand. It may not seem like a tablet, but that's a tablet device that we wanted to show here. And she's visiting a village uh, participant. She measures the blood pressure, blood sugar, captures data on the tab. Then the data are all relayed to the doctor via cloud. And then the doctor can in real time see all the reports and prescribe a medication, which can be printed out with a portable wireless printer that is available with the health worker. And in her bag, small bag that she carries, she has lots of material, which I will show you in a bit, and also has common medicines that are used for treatment of hypertension and diabetes. So this is what is a strategy that we conceived. This is what it looked like when we wanted to go ahead with it. And I will show you how it really translated into reality and we achieved some encouraging success with it. So this is the health workers kit. Uh, here we have the weighing scale, we have the measuring tape, we get the BMI, with, from the height and weight that we measure. The health worker is trained to do all of this. This is the tablet device. And these are all the paraphernalia associated with it to connect it with the glucometer and then to also connect it with the blood pressure device. One important aspect of our study is we do not allow the health worker the flexibility or option to enter manual data after measurement on an individual. This is all electronic data capture without any manual involvement. It's all automated data entry. We do not want any errors at the time of data entry to happen. And these are all the common medicines. And we took care to see that these medications are the medicines that are commonly given by the local health authorities because we wanted to transition the people that we have identified and put people on treatment to be able to get the medicines from the government someday because sustainability is by and large possible only at a massive level through the government support, at least in India at the moment. So we took care to see that the medicines that are to be given to people with hypertension, diabetes will be something which will match with whatever the government is giving because when we transition these people to the government system, there will not be any discrepancy or interruption in the medications that they get, both in terms of the pharmacological aspects of it or the physical aspects of it. And one question always arises in a community setting. How do we do the blood pressure measurement? Do we really have the health worker trained to do all the nitty gritties of measuring a blood pressure in terms of the number of measurements, then taking care to see that it is really accurate and valid, how many measurements? We can't overwhelm a simple ASHA with uh, a 10th grade educational qualification. She's already doing 
tremendous amount of work magnanimously with the low uh, amount of remuneration that she gets we didn't want to overwhelm her with the complicated calculations that go into determining someone if they have a blood pressure elevated to qualify as hypertensive or not so we took away that part of the intelligent uh, requ- uh, commitment to work from the asha lessened her mental burden and created an algorithm in the back end in our uh, tablet device so when the blood pressures are measured the tablet automatically prompts the health worker whether the person is flagged for further measurements for hypertension or the patient is non hypertensive for example the blood pressure measurements there is a complicated process given by aha and also the european society of cardiology they say at each visit measure multiple times and take average for example the esc and the canadian heart association they say that take at least three measurements at each visit discard the first one average the two second and third so this part is all inbuilt into the tablet and which is connected via a usb cable to the blood pressure measuring device and that is how the health worker just fulfills the requirement of connecting it to the participant and measuring at one minute intervals and rest of the task whether the person is to be followed up subsequently for diagnosis of hypertension or not and how many visits if so is all determined by the tablet and if anyone has the first visit blood pressure after the three measurements as 180 110 then the tab automatically shows this patient is hypertensive there is a flagging that happens and an alert immediately goes to the doctor and the doctor then also gets a prompt on his mobile to connect via skype onto the tablet that is operated by the health worker because this is a elevated blood pressure very high blood pressure and probably the patient might be in need of uh, urgent uh, attention to go to the hospital so therefore this type of inbuilt facilities are there not to tax the health worker and uh, keep it very simple for them on the ground still maintain accuracy and validity of blood pressure so going to the doorstep of beneficiaries does not in any way compromise the quality accuracy and validity of the blood pressure measurements here so we use for blood pressure diagnosis 180 110 on the first visit itself of the three measurements or if someone is suspect that is systolic greater than 140 diastolic greater than 90 but less than 180 110 respectively then the individual is prompted by the tab to be followed up second day and third day and the visits are scheduled accordingly with the help of the prompt system that is their decision support system which i may call on the tablet so this decision support system is actually a support system for the health worker doesn't really tax her and this decision support system allows smooth functioning of the entire project so that is how multiple measurements are made across visits and average across these visits is taken we take average across three visits to confirm someone has hypertension not to allow false labeling of hypertension and we have calculated this and saw that if you end up diagnosing hypertension only with two measurements versus three measurements the third measurement actually cuts down the number of hypertensives by a significant number at least one in six individuals will be false label falsely labeled with hypertension if we end up diagnosing with only two visits and it will be uh, one individual less for every six individuals diagnosed if we include the third visit of course it is a luxury if you can do three visits but most guidelines say two or more visits so that is what we followed and we used the three visits not at all compromising on the quality of diagnosis of hypertension though it is remote diagnosis of hypertension with the doctor sitting somewhere else and for the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus again we use a point of care glucometer for the initial fasting blood sugars uh, and the fasting blood sugar threshold of above 125 was used to identify people then they were offered to undergo hba1c and the hba1c cut off of 6.5 or more was used to diagnose people with diabetes again this is a a uh, reasonably robust way of identifying people with diabetes though the gold standard would have been an oral glucose tolerance test but then considering the large scale uh, uh, number of people that we need to do in a field setting even in hospitals people generally do not do a ogtt always to determine and most guidelines say that you can use two methods for uh, independently different methods for diagnosing uh, diabetes and that is what we used the fasting blood sugar and nhba1c and we also did serum creatinine because hypertension diabetes take their toll on kidney in addition to the heart and the brain and picking up this can actually potentially prevent significant expenditure to the people in terms of going for repeated dialysis or renal transplant and also sometimes risking their lives and losing a productive years of their life due to chronic kidney disease that could not be reversed so creatinine is something which we do in people with hypertension and diabetes annually and do the egfr estimation to see that people are tracked 
to assess their level of renal function and at the earliest that the renal function is dipping and which needs care we refer them to a nephrologist for treatment so the intervention strategy that i showed was a illustrative image of what we conceived when we wanted to do it and this is uh, the real uh, implementation image that is uh, displayed here one of our health workers with a bag with a tablet in her hand visiting a home and then there is one of these participants she is capturing the data electronically so this is a transition from our paper pen based method of data collection so we moved to the electronic data capture and we were a little skeptical initially whether the health workers will be able to do it or not especially if the asha profile health workers but they really rose up to the occasion they built their competencies we supported them did hand holding and that is how they were able to do all of this and then the blood pressure measurements automated data entry that happens and then the blood sugar measurements again automated data entry through the usb cable and all of these data including the serum creatinine data we had a tie up with the laboratory that did the serum creatinine hba1c for the samples that were transported to them and we built up a back end mechanism between the lab and our hospital so that all this data including the social demographics and the health related history parameters that are captured as a part of the questionnaire those as well as the blood pressure blood sugar creatinine and any other medication the patient is taking data become populated and are available to the doctor as a comprehensive electronic health record so this is what actually is the real advantage to the doctor sitting somewhere he has details even before he can talk to the patient he has details of the patient social demographics past medical history he has details of the medication that the person is using if any he has details of the blood pressure he has details of the hba1c he has serum creatinine also so that actually is a uh, reasonably robust way in which a doctor patient interaction can happen uh, given the circumstances in which overcrowded clinics in india ill equipped clinics in india and probably uh, not so well manned and well trained doctors being available in the rural area so this is what we wanted to create a some sort of standardization for the healthcare for hypertension and diabetes which is supported by digital technology and responsible health workers both on the field and off the field and the doctors dashboard as i said prompts the doctor to decide what medicines to be given and then the uh, doctor delivers an electronic prescription in real time on the upper right hand side you see the portable printer on a chair and the health worker is printing out the doctor issued prescription right there at the point of care and then on the basis of the prescription the medicines are distributed by the health worker see gives an appointment to the participant for the next follow up visit which we did once in a month initially till the blood sugar sense uh, blood pressure was stabilized and later it was 3 months we did this project for about 4 uh, years and we initially told the people that we will give the free medicines but gradually we will connect you to health system and then uh, you will be transitioned to get the medicines from there but we continue to follow up those people once in a month for their fasting blood sugars and blood pressures over and above what's happening to them through the healthcare system so basically this is screening proactively people providing them initial treatment and then subsequently transferring them to the health system so that is what we did in this project and what were the features of the tetra m health tool that we used by the way i need to mention here that the tetra m health tool that we developed was on a windows platform because back then about 4 to 5 years ago the android platform was still evolving and most of the devices the blood pressure measuring device the blood sugar measuring device their drivers were not compatible easily with the android software for automated data entry and that was the only reason why we had to use a windows platform though it was actually not an open source and it is a little expensive and we knew that tomorrow if this model has to be scaled up we will have issues we said we need to demonstrate the concept as such proof of principle and concept we need to generate the software can any time be changed depending on the feasibility and that is what now we are at we are now transitioning to uh, the software being done on an android platform so the previously existing platform what all it could do was real time data upload to a secure cloud text alerts to the physician as i alluded to previously for teleconsult generates electronic health records reasonably robust otherwise in india now what happens is people go to hospital they get a slip of paper the slip is gone and the patient doesn't know last time blood pressure blood sugar neither the medicines nor the values of mm, creatinine or anything else so next time he goes again everything is worked up so it actually defeats the purpose of uh, chronic care continuum and that is what we thought that the care continuum can be 
uh, established through a digital mode and people can have a longitudinal care and uh, a evidence-based decision process can be built into care for hypertension and diabetes longitudinally. Then it schedules the follow-up visits for the health worker. The health worker doesn't have to think, last time, when did I visit you? When do I go? So health worker gets updates on her tab, like who is due the next day, next week, next month. And she alerts those people well in advance and make sure that there is a mutually convenient time at which she can meet with them and have these measurements and then connect to the doctor if needed. Then we also have an online digital and visual data analytics on our website. Uh, if time permits, I'll just uh, take you to our website and show, but of course that is passcode protected. And that is basically from a monitoring evaluation surveillance perspective. We can instantly track in each village, how many hypertensives are there, how many diabetics are there, how many have they under control, how many are not controlled, how many participants the health worker visited on each day, what is the level of adherence. We use standardized medication adherence tools also to assess the adherence of these participants apart from the rest of the data that we get. So we have almost instantaneous data available to us on the health workers performance as well as the quality of control of blood pressure and blood sugar of these participants. This actually helps us to initiate remedial measures immediately once we know that in some village most people are not having blood pressure control or not having diabetes control. So we can pinpoint those and uh, see what best can be done and people can be immediately connected to advanced level of healthcare beyond the telemedicine doctor to see if there is something that needs to be evaluated further to help the people get their blood pressure, blood sugars and something else related to them under control. Currently, Tetra has screened 7,000 individuals across six villages. Of course, all these individuals are age 20 and above. And then we had about 1,600 individuals with hypertension and 600 with diabetes being followed up. Just to give uh, the numbers, what is the yield of our Tetra? 40% for hypertension screening. So 40% of the people who are unaware of their blood pressures yet were identified with the screening strategy that we use in Tetra. And uh, nearly a third of the people with diabetes who did not have a previous diagnosis known to them were identified. Mean reduction in systolic about 18, diastolic 15 millimeters and fasting blood sugar meaning mean reduction was about 26 milligrams percent. And Good thing was glycosylated hemoglobin before and after comparison, 1% change. Of course, this is not a randomized controlled trial, but for an implementation project, this is the best that we could put up before and after. And blood pressure and blood sugar control achieved was overall 56%. This includes both people with a past medical history and people newly detected by us, and 34% among diabetics. So considering the literature that says that blood pressure control is only one fifth and one tenth, in rural and urban India. So this is reasonably uh, uh, good uh, advanced achievements that we got in terms of the blood pressure specifically. Diabetic surprisingly, world over, it seems that people are not really going up beyond 30, 35% because diabetes is much more than just, I think, blood sugar control and that we realize it. Only thing is we wanted to at least make sure that we identify people, reach out to people, put them on medication and the comprehensive care for diabetes can come in later. So encouraged by the results of the Tetra for hypertension and diabetes, we knew that apart from hypertension and diabetes, when a health worker goes, there are a lot of people in the home. And these people with hypertension and diabetes also say that, you know, why do you only look at us for hypertension and diabetes? There are many things that hurt us. My joint pains, my joints hurt me. My cough hurts me. My, you know, uh, uh, heart, I have a problem. I have a problem with my kidneys. So if people who are not having hypertension and diabetes have some other problems, and if the health worker says, I'm sorry, I cannot help you, that looks a little uh, impractical and also unreal. So therefore we said that if the health worker is already going to the homes of the people, why don't we expand the concept of this? With little additional costs, can we include more screening? Can we include screening for age category wise specific conditions where we can screen and put them on treatment? And that is actually the expanded Tetra, which we have completed uh, conceptualizing and also the software part is in the process of being designed on an Android platform. So apart from hypertension, diabetes, it includes conditions. For example, for pregnant women, point of care, blood pressure, complete urine examination, blood picture to identify if they were anemic and also motivate them to attend antenatal checkup. Then children about six years, less than six years, complete blood picture to pick up anemia, then thyroid function because thyroid function is simple, easy to identify the derangements 
and also has got tremendous consequences for developing children both physically and mentally so we didn't want children to have poor scholastic performance poor physical growth just because their thyroid was not good and no one picked it up so this is important aspect why we wanted to do the thyroid function of course the nutritional status by anthropometry and then immunization and mobilizing people for immunization if they are not immunized against the vaccine preventable diseases and all is anyway going on we continue with that and people between 6 to 9 all of the things that we do for children less than 6 but are actually we screen for eye ear nose throat and skin diseases as well and for the adolescents we are planning for apart from the blood picture and the height and weight tsh again thyroid then skin ear nose throat eye diseases and also the blood pressure measurement in india we don't have blood sugars and blood pressure measurements on adolescents in a large way that's available to us no large data set has it so maybe we will try to get at least a semblance of it from the study that we are doing here so service with research is what our motto is and then for adults between 19 and 60 we have the blood sugars apart from the blood picture and blood pressure and then also the thyroid and ent people above 60 we also plan to get a ecg uh, point of care and also the creatinine estimation because people above 60 tend to really have uh, onset of the kidney disease and may progress silently and uh, picking it up early might have significant advantages so what do we want to do with all of this that we are doing is the goal is to digitize health information of all individuals at least in the 50000 population and create a prototype for the rest of india because countries across the globe are increasingly adopting technology and people want healthcare to be a part of the digital revolution and it will also help in customizing healthcare to generate finally a template for precision medicine for it has been too long now the medicine has been practiced on a mass scale approach one size fits all but then it's now gradually inching towards the goal of precision medicine and we want to actually lay the foundation for this by creating longitudinal health records that are digitally accessible available portable and also of global health standards for example we are working on not only collecting the data but also making it fire compatible that is fast health interoperable resource compatible so that it's on par with the global standards of uh, data functionality security and utility so that is what we envision digitizing health records and creating seamless portability for the people so democratic approach to healthcare data in the hands of the people about their own health they can choose the healthcare provider and they have a rich uh, treasure of background information about their health and suddenly someone falls sick people don't have to really worry about the sickness was contributed by something or another thing they know at least over a period of time what all factors might possibly contribute to the type of outcome what will be the prognosis and what treatment best suits that individual so i stop my overview of what we have done with the hypertension diabetes and what we plan to do with the expanded version of the tetra by taking healthcare to the homes of the people as far as possible not to say that you know we are uh, cutting off all the need to go to the hospital this is the first level of primary health care making availability and accessibility the fulcrum of our intervention and as and when required at the discretion of the doctor the health worker and the doctor can facilitate the people's access to health care so this is what i uh, wanted to share with you all and we are going strong with this uh, and in a few months once the covid situation improves a little bit further it's already on the improvement uh, trend in our geographic location possibly in few months we will go ahead with implement the expanded tetra also and hopefully next time when we meet we will have data even from that so looking forward to some interaction discussion comments and suggestions from improvement from you all and thank you all for a patient listening thank you uh, this is dr jindal again i have two comments um congratulations on the work you are doing uh, you must have seen on the box we have a similar project in gujarat called the sevakproject.org uh, which we have been running for now 12 years and i have extended this to guyana in south america um, so we cannot create or we cannot reach 1 million villages in india so what we have done is to create models so people can come and see what we are doing and then try and replicate that work elsewhere that's number one number we have a website and we have an annual conference which i think you attended in in baroda in 
I think I was there at that time. And the second is um, in over 100,000 people we have surveyed, we found that the main problem was lack of education or awareness of Ayushman Bharat, where the primary health center, primary health care, the PHC, is doing a lot of the work, but the people are not going there. And now we are trying to understand with a qualitative survey of why people are not going there. Is it because they don't trust the government? Is it because there's a long line, wait, lack of follow-up, and so on? And we have been talking to the head of Ayushman Bharat, Mr. Javeri in New Delhi. Um, and he's very much interested is when the government of India has put millions and millions of dollars, there is an underutilization of services. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jindal, for, uh, you know, um, uh, appreciating our work and also um, enlightening us on the Savak project that you're doing. Yes, I happen to um, uh, go uh, through that type of work on uh, several publications that have been there and also through your website. And I have been myself associated with PHFI for my postdoctoral fellowship, mentored mm -hmm. under Dr. Prabhakaran in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. So some of this uh, work that we do is all to an extent inspired and also um, driven through the inputs that we get from Dr. Prabhakaran and Dr. Srinath Reddy mm -hmm. from PHFI. And if I can come in, I think Dr. Jindal, what you rightly said, especially with the Ashman Bharat, uh, with the clinics that has not seen the input from our uh, you know, people coming to the clinics, there is now slowly a move towards population-based screening for non-communicable diseases which is being tested as a part of Aishman Bharat and also as a part of this non-communicable diseases clinics or health and wellness clinics. Uh, one of the states which is now trying it out is Tamil Nadu. I think other states will also come, uh, uh, surely, you know, will start doing that because they're, they're now the, uh, the move is towards going to the population and screening in the population. So, I think, yes, what you say is right, because there are a lot of this qualitative issues or barriers which the people feel in terms of reaching out to the clinic. I think that is being cut out now through population-based screening. Hopefully, things would function a bit better as we move along for a large scale of population in this country. Thank you. Dr. Shailendra, I just wanted to highlight some of the questions from our audience members starting with Valerie Fields, she wanted to know about the data you present on the results of the pilot TETRA project. Over what period of time did you achieve those blood pressure and glucose uh, controls that you indicated? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the uh, data that I showed was the current one, but the publication that we did for the initial two years of the pilot study and the results that we published initially are not very different from what I have shown today. And uh, about uh, two thirds of the people with their blood pressures and about one third of people with their blood sugars have it under control. And you know, each individual for the pilot data, we had followed up for about two years. So essentially you can say that it will be about one and a half to two years that it takes for people to achieve that type of a blood pressure control and a blood sugar control as well. Great. The next question is from Jessica Wilson. Wanted to know a little bit about community acceptance of the programs. Have there been challenges in this area? Right. The community acceptance for the blood pressure part was over 90% because it's a non-invasive process. But when we did the fasting blood sugars, it dipped to 80% because people didn't want in the villages even to be pricked on their finger for the blood sugar to be tested. And it further dipped to 70% when we wanted to draw 2 ml of venous blood for their HbA1c to be done. So for some things that's non-invasive, like blood pressure recording, more than 90% people are open to it. But when it comes to finger prick, about a 10% dropped off in our population at least. And then when we wanted a 2 ml venous draw from them for the HbA1c test to confirm a diagnosis of diabetes, a further 10% drop. So overall, it was about 70%. So people are very active. I'll share an interesting uh, anecdote. Initially, people were a little wary. They said, we don't want to get pricked. We don't want to get our blood sample tested. We don't have diabetes. Our families never had diabetes. So please go away. But when they saw people who were getting these tested, where people were going to their homes and providing medicines, and those people started having uh, a good feedback, 
to the rest of the community, then more people became motivated and they started coming in and started requesting, can you please include us in the study? But then we had a protocol which said that, uh, you know, we enroll participants only within a certain time period uh, from their first point of contact. And though we unofficially did the study on them, they could not figure in the list of the accepted participants. So the list of accepted participants overall is about 70%, but it's split across diabetes and hypertension. Hypertension, a little more participation, 90%, diabetes, 70%. Related <clears throat> related to that question about blood draw, how do you overcome it in children in particular? Yeah, that's why, you know, we have uh, taken only people 20 years and above because we were very sensitive to people in the villages being a little circumspect and concerned and anxious too. And rightly also for children to be drawn and also the yield of really identifying someone with the diabetes in children is too low. So the effort that we put in identifying someone with uh, diabetes by subjecting them to an invasive procedure, the yield is justifiable to the risk that we pose to them, at least a minor in terms of pricking for the blood sample, if they're 20 and above, but not less than 20, because the yield is too low. So we didn't focus on including them in our study. I guess for the expanded Tetra project, you'll have to come up with a plan to address that because you'll be enrolling a much younger uh, population. Right, we thought over it and even our IRB has actually sensitized to it. And, uh, you know, uh, we thought that for the complete blood picture part of it, if the child is cooperative and if the child gives an assent and the parent gives a consent and within the legal purview of the ethics and the IRB approval, we go ahead with the blood sample to be drawn. Otherwise, we just do the hematocrit by the WHO method where we just take a drop of blood and then uh, assess the hematocrit and divide the hematocrit by three to get the hemoglobin value. At least we diagnose anemia by that. But on another related note, I would like to say that Dr. Jami in his presentation mentioned about the zero surveillance for COVID that we are currently doing in 5,000 population at our site. And there we have participants two years and above, and we have been two months through the project. And it's very, very encouraging and heartening to note that parents have been very cooperative, children have been cooperative, and we have been able to draw blood from them. So that gives heart and also motivates us and makes us realize that you know, it's not that difficult if we convey to the people the benefit that is um, going to accrue to them over a period of time, probably through the rapport that we have and the health workers facilitating the process, we will be in a position to even draw the blood as and when needed to justify the uh, protocol and also to serve the people in need. Great. The next question is from Jeremy Short. Can you elaborate a little bit on the components of patient education and self-care in this Tetra project? Right, so we have developed the information education communication material, which we call the IEC. So the first level of information education happens through the community health worker, again, who is very well trained before they step into the field to do their work. So they are shown videos, they are uh, made to uh, talk to simulated individuals, and then they interact with the uh, PI and other experts in diabetes and hypertension. And once we are confident that these people have gained the competency to elicit the confidence of the people in communicating effectively about the hypertension and diabetes, they do it. I agree that that's not the sole focus of our intervention. Our intervention is primarily screening people and connecting to uh, the doctor for treatment. The softer part of hypertension diabetes management in terms of educating people and ensuring that they get efficacy, we are looking forward to people who are experts in lifestyle and behavior modification with well-defined concrete strategies which can be implemented in this population and that can actually help us achieve a better level of diabetes control especially and also improve our hypertension control with the twinning of the lifestyle and behavior changes in addition to the treatment that we do with the medications. So there is scope for improvement. If anyone has a concrete plan to engage with the diabetic and pre-diabetic population, hypertensive and the pre-hypertensive population with a diabetes prevention program or things like that, lifestyle modification programs, we will be very open to a collaboration and that can be implemented in this population. Just to add on to this, I say that we have 1700 people with hypertension diagnosed, but we have twice as many people with prehypertension who potentially will explode as hypertensives and a systematic evidence-based lifestyle modification program if implemented can show us some direction to see how we can delay the prehypertensives from becoming hypertensives and pre-diabetics from becoming diabetics. We look forward to some ideas, collaborations, and opportunities for working together on it. 
Can you speak a little bit uh, about how your program works with the India, the government of India's chronic disease prevention program? What are some of the, yeah, speak a little bit about how you link people into the healthcare system and also talk about maybe some similarities and differences between your approach and the, the government approach. Right, when we started this program way back in 2014, uh, the government of India did not have a system where the health workers visited homes of the participants, measured their blood pressure, blood sugar. And then we always knew that the biggest barrier is getting the people to the healthcare facility. So people would choose to ignore the silent conditions like hypertension and diabetes until it hurts them. And that is how we miss them early on when we could make a big impact. And therefore we choose this option of going to the people and picking up them much earlier than uh, what the health system usually does. Now, uh, the government is initiating population-based screening. At least in our state, there is a program that is designed and waiting to be implemented. Because of COVID, it could not be implemented. So they have now empowered the ASHAs and those ASHAs go to people's homes and measure the blood pressure, blood sugar but they don't really have the type of decision support system for a robust diagnosis of hypertension and diabetes at the moment. What we know they want to do is just measure the blood pressure, leave the blood pressure measurement to the health worker and blood sugar is just with a glucometer. And that is the only thing. They are primarily looking at people who already have a past medical history of hypertension and identify them and deliver the medicines at their doorsteps. But really identifying people who are not yet diagnosed with hypertension and diabetes in an accurate and valid manner to avoid all false positives and condemning people to medications for hypertension, diabetes with all the potential risks uh, is uh, not really well worked out from the way the government's plan at the moment looks. So there is where we offer to the government probably this type of a solution where we say we are free and uh, to share our uh, innovation and that can be used for uh, enabling the health workers to use accurate and valid measurements for confirming either hypertension or diabetes. Great. Can you elaborate a little bit about the ongoing training you provide to the community health workers and how do people in the community connect with this community health workers when they have emergencies? Right. So our community health volunteers or health workers have been there in the community since about uh, two decades. So they have a very good rapport with the people and they being from the same village, they gel with them very seamlessly. And the training uh, for these health workers that we do is based on some principles that we use for training our nursing staff on the medical school students. We use the competency framework. We use the uh, approach of going from knowledge, comprehension, analysis, and also to see that they acquire the abilities. And we use a lot of training methodologies which are interactive and skill building in nature. For example, audiovisual aids, then demos, and then uh, direct observation of certain procedures being done and independent performance. And also before going to independent performance, performance under supervision, under handholding, and then they become uh, certified to do this. We are actually talking to certain uh, foundations in India, which are doing the modules for skill development and upskilling the people in different sectors in India. Unfortunately, we don't have a comprehensive skill building program for hypertension, diabetes, and other healthcare related conditions, except for some minimum work that the ASHAs do. So for this type of work, like drawing the blood, measuring blood pressure, blood sugar, being aware of the common medicines, distributing the medicines, talking to people, creating awareness, enforcing the need for adherence to medication, identifying the potential people at risk for catastrophic events in the short term, connecting them to doctor, creating this type of a profile. Currently, we have worked out the outlines for this protocol and we are scouting for some organization which can give a uh, legal sanctity for the course that we are going to conduct and certificate that we are going to give because we are very enthusiastic and we are ready with the program to be launched. But there are very few takers because they say that if it is not really sanctified by a larger regulatory authority and is not accepted widely, how do we find an employment for whatever training and certification you give to us? So that is what we are looking at. It's a larger problem where we not only want to train, but we also want to see that the regulatory agencies do really uh, appreciate the need for building this type of skill in people on a large scale and try to empower them, enable them and make them ambassadors for change for health in the community. 
Great. And one more question in the chat about why did you decide to do fasting blood glucose in your Tetra screening project as opposed to, I guess, suppose, uh, you know, random blood glucose measurement? Right. So we had the double objective here. The twin objective was not only to really diagnose someone, but also help the physician make a, a conscious decision about starting them on medications. So random blood sugar seldom helps a physician in making a choice in treating the patient or even for assessing the need for titrating the medicine and changing the medicine. So fasting blood sugar gives a reasonable idea about uh, the patient's response to the medications that we have given. So we thought that fasting blood sugar is good not only to really diagnose them sequentially by following up with HbA1c, but also it gives us the opportunity to uh, track the response to treatment and therefore facilitate the up titration or down titration of medicine as and when we go along managing the patient with diabetes, basically from a treatment perspective, more than anything else. Great. And the, the CHWs in your Tetra program, are they volunteers or are they paid? Mm, so that's a real good question. So the CHVs are paid honorarium, a nominal honorarium is paid to them. So yes, they are paid. So initially we use the word volunteer, but then since we were offering them some honorarium, they were getting paid for the work they do. We changed the nomenclature and call them community health workers. Great. Uh, and please feel free if you want to chime in uh, with your questions, you can unmute yourself and pose your questions or continue to post them in the chat. But at this point, we'll move on to the final part of the presentation uh, with Dr. Einger. So I actually have a couple of questions for Dr. Shailendra. Um, yeah, one was, what were some of the technology issues that you encountered, like with internet access in these villages and, um, you know, like with bandwidth and stuff? Was that a big issue that sort of hindered your program and how did you all deal with that? Right. Uh, really, that's a very, very pertinent question. In fact, that was one of the key challenges that we had when we conceived the project. And five years ago, when we started implementing this project, India was not having the 4G network available. It was still 2G at most places and in some places 3G. So we in intentionally choose those locations which were having good internet connectivity to launch because we wanted to establish a proof of principle and they didn't want to mess up by trying to implement in an area where it is not at all feasible, where the network is not there. Because one of the key ingredients for this whole technology based platform to operate is a good internet connectivity. Fortunately for us, within one and a half years of launching of this project, India transitioned to 4G. And in no time, whole of India was having excellent bandwidth, 4G. And for a great part of one, one and a half years after being launched, the 4G was free for people. And we didn't have any technological issues after that. So yes, initially for the first one and a half years, we tried to navigate through that problem by choosing only those villages. We did a uh, mapping out of villages in terms of the network connectivity and choose those villages only where the network was allowing us to implement this project seamlessly. And subsequently, when we moved to the rest of the villages, we were uh, very pleasantly, you know, surprised with uh, the 4G connectivity being available even in some of the deeper villages, which were previously not even having a 2G connection. So currently, we are very happy with uh, all our 50 villages having, uh, 40 villages in fact, having the 4G connection and excellent bandwidth. There are rarely, if any, signal disruptions. The technology part of it is really very robust now. When you say it's free, how do they get it free? Do they, I mean, is it just something that the government of India has or? Um... Right, it was free through the service provider. For example, in India, Reliance launched its 4G program and it okay. said that you just need to buy a SIM card and put it in your phone. And for the first three months or six months, you don't need to pay anything. I am just testing out my system. They said that if people who are using it free use it to the maximum, it will challenge my system and I can see if my system can handle that. It can handle anything else anytime. So it was actually a technology platform robustness assessment on behalf of the service provider. And uh, later on also, the costs are too low it's not really very high. The costs are quite low and easily manageable. And of course, the point that we need to remember here, which is the limitation probably of our study is that the health workers are actually the people who carry the technology to the people here. The people themselves have poor efficacy and their affordability issues in terms of devices and all is there. Not many people have smartphones at their home. They don't have blood pressure monitors and blood sugar devices. 
so we actually are trying to take the healthcare to the beneficiaries with the health worker so if the technology part is a barrier the technology part is a barrier from the health workers perspective not the participant here probably in future as we transition and people start getting technology into their homes and more people have their smartphones and they have their blood pressure devices and all then uh, the cost of the technology from the individual users perspective will come in at the moment the costs of the technology are borne by the organization that is we who are conducting the study perfect i think once you know i finish my presentation there will be some questions and we can probably talk a little bit more about some of these issues because they are going to go across borders and across nations so uh, if there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen and start my presentation. All right. All right. So um, we're going to talk about the same thing. So it was interesting, I think, um, as a part of my global health and my interest, because I grew up um, in India and actually did my medical schooling. I didn't do a lot of practice, but um, I took a global health trip um, as a part of our um, organization from uh, McGowan to India. And I actually got a chance to interact with both Dr. Jami as well as Dr. Shailendra. And I actually went on a trip and I was fascinated um, with this work. And I mean, I, it just was something that I was like right away trying to say, how do I put this into a system? And why did that come in? Because some of the common issues that struck to me actually in the car was that we have diabetes prevalence, which is quite high in India. And then it is quite high in Texas, which is close to about, you know, 10 to um, 11%. And as I drove through some of the villages and as I drove, you know, as a part of our training, we have clinics in um, areas which are very socioeconomic with, you know, um, with low poverty, high poverty indexes. And so it, there would seem to be the same socioeconomic disparity that existed between both populations. Um, both countries were trying to control diabetes better with improvement of hemoglobin A1C. Um, so that's how I was like, we probably need to learn something. So this trip actually was um, educative as well as for them, as well as for us. And I think I took back a lot more information from their project so that I could bring it back to uh, my school and sort of implement it. So a little bit about Texas. Um, we are the Lone Star State, and I'm sure my other participants from the other um, states will agree. Uh, and um, so interestingly enough, we have 29 million residents um, and 40% of those are Hispanic or Latino. We have 41% who are whites. We have 13% black and 5% Asian. So you do see that we do have a different diverse population. And we have, if you look at it, we're about 59 to 60% other ethnicities. Houston is a big city in Texas, and I'm sure some, I mean, some of you might have visited it. We are um, right at the southern part. We are about 7.1 million. Um, some more facts. We, the biggest county of Houston is called Harris County, and one of the largest counties in Texas. And the rate of expansion of this county has been at pretty high at 40% more than 70% of the Harris County's 4.7 million residents, they identify as Hispanic, African-American, or Asian, 44% Hispanic or Latino, 20% Black, and 7% Asian. What is Houston famous for? We're the first, fourth most populous city in the country. We're home to the largest medical center in the world called the Texas Medical Center. We have more than 145 different languages spoken. So we are a very, very diverse state, um, city, sorry. It's also common to the first, to the world's first dome stadium, which is called the NRG stadium. And we are proud because we have the livestock rodeo show, which is one of our biggest shows. So we have a lot of animals, we have singers, we have quite a few people 
to about 50,000 in some of those um, shows, which unfortunately in the last two years we haven't been able to put forth due to COVID. But we also have some very sobering facts. So since 2000, the number of extremely low income households in Harris County has increased by 25%. A great proportion of those are Black, Hispanic, and minority residents, and they live in mostly high poverty neighbor neighborhoods. 2015, home ownership among the white residents of Houston was 60%, compared to 39% among Hispanics and 33% among um, African Americans. There's also evidence supporting racial disparities in income in Houston. So according to the Equity Atlas in 2015, the wage of the workers of color was $15 less than those of the white workers. Notably, the race-based wage cap has more than doubled over the 35-year period between 1980 to 2015. So this is just one of the articles that came up in the business econ economy section of Wall Street. And it says that Houston has among most po newly poor neighborhoods in nation. And that's what that report showed. So of course the Houston Health Department had to come up with something because this was starting to get to the national data system. So they have developed a strategic framework which includes a vision, a mission, which basically they're trying to see that they want all the families and neighborhoods to be self-sufficient with health, health and self-care needs. The mission is basically also to do the same and to be able to provide that. They've used different ways as their values like accountability, integrity, equity. Um, their success factors, basically what they're trying to do is customer service. They want to make sure communications, um, empowerment. What are some of the, the strategies that they're using? They're using the strategies of partnerships, which is very important. They're using systems, they're making sure equity is one of them. They're using sustainability and then making sure infrastructure is strong. Um, what are some of the high performance factors? We also know it's people, you know, project processes, policies, programs. What are some of the strategic priorities? Access to care, preparedness, child and maternal health, NCDs, infectious disease, environmental health. So these are some of the main frameworks that they're working off of. So Actually, it was very impressive um, when I actually went to um, see the Tetra project because geomapping um, was something that we have started. And I, I, when we end the session in our q and I'd love to hear from the other universities how well they're using geomapping in their um, communities because we um, have a, a, a very good um, School of Public Health in Houston. And so many of them are using geomapping, but with as with any big medical center, we work in our own silos and we never communicate. So as a part of training, one of the interns from the School of Public Health was working with me, and that is how I got to know about their extensive geomapping um, uh, you know, platform that they were using. So they use something called the Area Deprivation Index, which is basically ranking neighborhoods by socioeconomic status, disadvantage based on factors for like uh, theoretical domains like income, education, employment, and housing quality. So we then use that and got the information to our clinic, which um, you know we got the address, we mapped it, and then we said, which are the addresses within a 15 minute drive from our clinic? So we did that. And so basically, if you look that the black square is where our um, clinic is. And so we mapped out a 15 area diameter around that to see, you know, to get some ideas. And then we sort of um, superimposed some of the areas for dense and sparse areas, um, basically for diabetes as well as its populations. So that's when we said we put the census and then we put the diabetic panels and then we sort of looked at that area and found areas where there was, you know, high rate of diabetes prevalence with a high number of population groups. So that was how we developed our initial area to find out. And this was primarily developed just after I came back from my trip to India and I said, hmm, if, you know, we need to look into this. And I will tell you a little bit about how that came about. So 
The diabetic stats in 2018, 10.5% of Americans were estimated to have diabetes, 78% of which were diagnosed, and another 22% were undiagnosed. 1.5 million new cases of diabetes are diagnosed every year. Texas is about the same. The prevalence has been increasing. We have about 11.4%, which is slightly higher than the national rate. And again, it varies by race and ethnicity, and both Hispanics and non-Hispanic African-Americans have a higher prevalence of diabetes than their white counterparts. So one of the things that struck me is I've been practicing family medicine and also inpatient care for the last 25 years. I have patients who I have taken care of for these 25 years, and I've noticed that several of them probably have not changed their hemoglobin A1C from 9 to maybe an eight, but never to an optimal level of 7%, even getting to that. So that was one of my factors saying, what am I doing wrong? Over the years, we went into the team-based approach. So our clinic actually has a case manager, has a community health worker, but they work within the clinic. So whenever we have a patient who has uncontrolled diabetes, they get hooked on to the um, you know, we activate the case managing system, the case manager comes, talks to them, you know, discusses some of their barriers, but it's all done in the clinic. There is no pattern where actually we are going into the community, bringing up. So that's when I started asking my question, what is it that we're doing wrong? Is there something that we're missing? And why are some of these patients not responding to what we're doing? So some of the current national targets control um, in diabetes control want us to reduce the proportion of people with diabetes that is defined as greater than 9% uncontrolled diabetes to 16.2% or less. Um, that's the um, healthy 2010, um, 2020 target. Barriers to attaining the needed care and control to diabetes, there were several barriers, and some of them are health related, some, I mean, system related, and some related to patients. So, determinants of optimal um, control. So, basically, the several factors, right? We all know socioeconomic factors such as income, education level, health insurance status for people in the United States, other factors are general health status access to care, patient beliefs and attitudes about a disease, the physician's attitude towards treating diabetes. And so, and we have taken um, diabetes interventions at the community level in various places with varying results. So talking a little bit about this. So there was a trial of a community-based diabetes intervention program, which involved older patients who had two or more co uh, comorbid conditions. And it showed that when you do have like a community-based program, it improves the quality of life, self-management, and a decrease in depressive symptoms. But a similar study, which was done in adult Hispanics who had co uh, poorly controlled diabetes using community health workers, did not yield an improvement in glycemic control or systemic blood pressure. So, you know, there may be different factors playing a role in different population groups. And I think that's what was highlighted uh, with this slide. So heterogeneity in outcomes may be due to the, the, qual the methodological quality, as well as length of follow-up and different components of the chronic care model that was applied. Use of community-based approach may improve outcomes, but we may have to apply many components of the CCM model. The novelty, so then we proposed something which uh, was a collaboration between our clinic and the community through a program called DON. So this we labeled it as collaborative clinic and community program to control diabetes. So the purpose was we have about 20% of patients who didn't have um, target um, control of their diabetes at less than 9%. We wanted to see how to improve that through a clinic and community collaboration. So it was non-randomized, it's a prospective one group intervention study. What we did was the way we were going to do is we were going to identify the patients who were receiving care at our clinic and basically whose hemoglobin A1C was greater than 9%. And we asked them if they want to sign up for this. The program would involve a lot of self-education, nutritional education, fitness education, and disease management support. We would assess the effectiveness of the program by comparing a mean change in hemoglobin A1C at three, six, and 12 months with the baseline. 
We also wanted to um, assess the changes in the plasma lipids, the systolic blood pressure, diabetes knowledge, self-efficacy, and quality of life. And so the goal was that if it was effective, we would expand the, uh, the program. So this is the Dawn Center. So this is basically a center that is, you know, was developed, built, and completely manned by the city of Houston. It's uh, Diabetes Awareness and Wellness Network. So this building has a, basically a fitness center. It's located in the exact zip code area where the, um, there's a lot of socioeconomic disparity. Access to care is high. There's a high level of diabetics. There is uncontrolled diabetes. So that was already done by geocode um, coding done by the city of Houston. They found the areas. They made sure that they looked at the barriers. It's very well connected with our metro system, which is the bus system in Houston. We do not have a very robust um, transportation system, but this clinic was connected to some of the outlying zip codes um, by buses like metro as well as the train system. Um, and so this is a center that has pretty much a nutritionist. It has a nurse. It has a fitness a center with a fitness personal trainer and also a little garden in the back to grow vegetables. This is our building in, you know, which is situated about hardly, I would say about seven miles away from that center, but a whole different population group that it tenders to. Um, and so it's important to understand that even though the mileage was just about five miles and for our counterparts from different countries, it's about 12 kilometers. And, um, but still the disparity in between the population groups was pretty significant. So we used the health belief model and basically the community and clinic will collaborate in carrying out program activities, which will improve knowledge and self-efficacy in diabetes management. So we were hoping that they would become more aware of their condition severity and hope that, that we can solve some of the barriers that they encounter in its control. They'll also, you know, become aware of the benefits to be, you know, derived by when they control the disease and also improve their clinical outcomes and better diabetes control. So we see over 700 patients with diabetes in a year. We estimate about 20% have hemoglobin A1C over 9%. And of course, we're below the national target of 16%. Uh, many of the patients with uncontrolled diabetes may not be receiving the nutritional, physical, therapeutic interventions due to a variety of barriers, whether it's knowledge, you know, management, attitude, financial resources, or social support. This is a very busy slide, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. So our primary objective is basically to see a mean change in the hemoglobin A1C with this program at 12 months. Secondary objectives were mean change in blood pressure, mean changes in plasma lipids, changes in diabetes knowledge, self-efficacy, and quality of life. So as we talked about, once they, we have a gap list as if, you know, the um, Center for Medicare for people from the other countries, we have um, CMS, which is called the Center for Medical uh, Medicare and Medicaid services, basically that tells us, you know, gives us a few guidelines and certain targets to achieve for chronic diseases. And so we are um, able to generate a gap list, which means that all the number of patients, we have a computer generated list, um, which is on a dashboard, giving us the names of the patients with their medical record numbers who have their hemoglobins greater than 9%. And we can do that daily by the hour, by the week, and basically that is given to the case manager. And so once that clinic, uh, when the patient comes to the clinic is identified as not having hemoglobin A1C um, under nine is flagged and the case manager will reach out to the patient when they arrive to clinic or by phone. So what is the partnership of Dawn? Um, so Dawn actually has a self-management program that is in that location, which is located right in the zip codes, and they also have some community health workers who go into the community and engage with the local leaders, like some of them are either from the local churches or, you know, like from the no local grocery store, community leaders, so that they can organize where people to sort of empower people to understand their disease, make sure that they provide local resources like being able to give them, you know, food coupons to be able to shop more, um, you know, effectively. Um, so it has a multi-professional team, but most of their activity happens in that center with a little bit 
out in the community. So they order, they, you know, they organize fairs and stuff, but they don't go door to door like some, like the ones that um, Dr. Shailendra was talking, but sort of they're very close to the community in that area. And they also have fitness education, nutrition education, all following ADA diagnose, I mean, uh, guidelines. So that's how we had a contract with them. So that we are a state um, school. So we are state as well as they were the city of Houston. So we were able to form a pact and saying that they were going to help us um, support this program. And so we were able to put some processes and policies in place. So that way, you know, get their IRB, our IRB approval so we could go forward with it. So what was determined was the enrolled patients will be required to attend the predetermined core diabetes educational sessions over a period of four months. Um, and then they were asked to be um, participate in the activities of the Dawn Center, which includes group classes, use of the gym, um, and also log their physical activity. And we asked them, you know, depending on their physician's prescription for health as well as exercise, if they did not have any contraindications, they were following the CDC guidelines. Basically, we would do some collection of data ahead of time before they start the program. So attendance would be logged, incentives for good attendance and positive changes would be administered in the form of either food coupons or, um, you know, like um, some of the local companies would give us cards for their um, uh, diabetes meters or for their strips or blood pressure machine. They were given education and nutrition provided with a list of healthy foods in the local grocery stores to help them shop. So what one of the things that Dawn Center with their nutrition, they went to these different stores and found which aisles had what of the healthy foods and made a list of all the healthy foods so that we could give it to the population and say, these are some of the foods that you could use. Um, and then there was a social worker between our social worker in clinic and the social worker at Dawn they would try to see if they would qualify for the food prescription program. So they, the participants would meet with the program team at the Dawn Center every four weeks to see how the progresses make adjustments. And if there's a need for the physician, there are two ways we could do it. If the physician actually needs to see them, for example, one of the case managers is a nurse and say they listen to the patient and say, you know, this patient has an irregular rhythm or seems to be having a pedal edema or seems to be having orthopnea. So where the physician is needed to examine an appointment would be made. If not, they have a way of now being able to communicate through Zoom to be able to have an interaction with the patient um, and, and make some changes there. Um, there's an agreement that a physician would be there at the Dawn Center every eight weeks to either take care of a patient's need there or have any specific questions in regards to a patient. But it was expected that they would be coming into the office either at four, six months, or 12 months to be able to um, uh, interact with the physician. So what were our outcome measures? We wanted to see a mean change of about 0.5% um, in our hemoglobin a A1C. Um, and um, with, you know, doing some of our analysis, we found that we needed a total sample of about 77%, I mean, 77 people to be able to make a reasonable study. Um, a primary outcome measure um, was, um, you know, basically hemoglobin A1C and then do an assessment three, six, and uh, 12 months. Secondary outcomes were blood pressure, lipids, anthropometric measures. The anthropometric measures were going to be done at the Dawn Center, but the blood work will be done at our lab. Um, so the other measures will be diabetes knowledge, self-efficacy and quality of life. And we were using the different um, all approved questionnaires um, uh, to do that. Data will be extracted from medical records by patients and also by surveys. We will um, have them in, you know, consent to obtain that data. We will have the variables measured at three, six and 12 months. And the data on self-efficacy and quality of life, if you've seen those surveys, they're pretty long. So we decided we'll just do it at baseline six months and 12 months. And they'll all be stored based on um, by a trained research assistant in secure areas at UT. We will compare the differences in the means of hemoglobin A1C at baseline six months, 12 months. And then we'll compare changes in all the different values as well as in knowledge and self-efficacy. So what happened? Um, well, COVID put a halt. So we got an IRB this, you know, I went to India, I think about 
18 months, close to about a two year ago, we started this project about a year and then come um, January, of course, COVID put a hole. So Dawn Center was closed. Our clinics were working, um, but the uh, Dawn Center actually was unable to even do virtually because, you know, many of the patients don't have access. Um, and we, you know, we did not. And that's when I think M Health became such an important one. Should we be equipping our patients who are in social with in poverty um, high areas with the ability to communicate? Because many of our physicians, I mean, patients don't have access to phones, access to smartphones, many of the libraries where they would use uh, internet and, um, you know, the computers were all closed. So there was no way for us, and the Dawn Center was also closed. Our clinic was up and running, but then transportation, metro, all of that was difficult. So at this point, we are ready. So what is Dawn Center doing? So the CMS, which is our center for, um, you know, from the federal government, we have submitted in addition now and as an addendum to be able to see if we can get some smart devices that we can use for our staff as well as for the patients. The, the logistic issues, they're not any different from us as well as uh, in low income or middle income, is how do we make sure that you know, these don't disappear, the smartphones don't disappear? How do we make sure that they're not using it for personal calls? Um, one of the interesting things, the Dawn Center was opened in 2015. And as Dr. Jamie, or I cannot, was it Dr. Shailendra, the utilization, or maybe even Dr. Jindal, the utilization of the center was very limited. We didn't understand why, and they have an excellent um, fitness center. They actually have a personal trainer that comes free, um, but people were not utilizing it. So we understand there may be a belief system that we're gonna have to probe into. What do people perceive this? There's a lot of trust issues with this population group with the Western medicine style. So, you know, it brought up a lot of those questions. And with COVID, I think, it even, uh, even made us think further, uh, maybe we need to tailor. So we may be getting ready to put an addendum on having a survey to identify some of the belief models that, you know, they, um, that comes with this population group. Um, so we've already actively started recruiting patients. Dawn Center now is able to do most of theirs virtually. They actually are outside. They have their, you know, tents outside. So patients drive in, they get down, they get their blood pressure machine and blood glucose checked, they have their anthropometric measures done. So I think we are ready to start recruiting and moving forward. The one thing that we have seen, maybe we're gonna add on to this is once we get approval and we're able to get resources to get our smart devices, where you know automatically we give blood pressure machines to patients and they're able to send us, you know, it directly links to our systems and we are able to download their um, blood sugars as well as their blood pressures and then we are able to actively do a team collaboration. The one thing that we're actively trying to also expand to is depression. Mental health has become a huge issue now with the COVID uh, pandemic. So we're trying to see how we can use M Health and our existing system to see if we can tag along our behavioral um, therapist to not only help with depression and, um, you know, counseling regarding uh, weight as well as diabetes. So that is where we are and we are going to actively start recruiting in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully with our next session, we should have some data for you all on how we did with this program. Um, I'm going to stop right there and I'm open to questions and comments. Thanks. Any comments? So I think one of the things for us is going to be um, what was very interesting is to see how, you know, the access with computers has been one of the difficult ones. We have had our school of public health do a project in some of the communities in Houston, 
And one of the biggest access, you know, we had issues was getting connectivity and, you know, sometimes losing internet and stuff and, and the safety of getting into these communities and actually having somebody knock on doors and stuff. So I'd like to see what some of the feedback from our friends out in India, did you ever have those issues with your community workers where, you know, the safety was um, something and then the belief system became an issue? Uh, no, not really, no, especially for hypertension and diabetes. There were some very few episodes where people's beliefs about uh, the hereditary nature of diabetes and hypertension was so strong that they felt that the health worker visiting the homes and measuring their blood pressures and blood sugars often would indicate that the family is strongly predisposed for diabetes and hypertension and that would affect the you know, um, prospect for marriage of their uh, subsequent generations. So people were a little worried about that. They didn't want health workers to be seen coming to their homes and indicate to the larger community that there is a diabetic or a hypertensive in this particular household. So but it was very, very small fraction. Out of the 7,000 individuals we touched upon, Hardly it would was uh, there in uh, four to five individuals, not more than that. So mostly there has been a big transformation in the way people understand hypertension and diabetes now that it's become increasingly common. So people have reconciled to the fact that uh, these are the problems on a larger scale and people accept it that hypertension diabetes is uh, a part of uh, healthcare need for lots of people and just shying away from it is going to hurt themselves in the long run. And they're very open to getting advice and also treated and followed up periodically. That's great. The uh, question for um, some of the um, other participants from the United States, does anybody have a program um, similar to this where they're actually using um, community health workers in the community, not so much into their clinics, but where they're actually going into and engaging with the community at a community level. Are you asking in the US or globally? No, I mean, in the U.S. or even globally, but I'm, I'm interested in, in the population in the U.S. because I think some of these interventions of going into the community is a little bit new for us. Um, sure. So I work with a reproductive health clinic um, in rural Minnesota. And one thing that they um, really focus on is, is STD um, or STI prevention. Um, in the community, we have really high rates of um, chlamydia and, and gonorrhea here. Um, so one way that they've kind of, it's, it's not really a community health worker approach um, per se, but they've really partnered with the local community college here, um, having kind of student uh, peer educators um, and working a lot with their nursing program to make sure the nurses in the area are um, educated and can educate their fellow students um, about those issues. So that's um, one thing that's been pretty successful for them here. Oh, interesting. And uh, one of the comments was, um, let me see how I can respond to this, um, which um, Purnima had was that input from the end users. So the, we, I think the Dawn program initially, when they were trying to set up, they, when they did, they did a survey to see what sort of programs they wanted. So I guess people did and, you know, whatever had the highest, um, you know, the, the positivity of the survey was what they included. So I think they are trying to see, you know, now doing some surveys and they're doing some um, research to figure out what are some of the reasons and barriers to uptake interventions right now. I mean, to, you know, the, for the in, uh, uptake of the interventions, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. mm. Right. 
Any other comments, suggestions, collaborations, anything? We're open to it at this point. I think one of the things that probably we will be moving forward to is starting to um, getting some of our smart devices into the community. I think um, the uh, state is, has applied for a huge funding to be able to get some of those devices which already have the blood pressures and blood sugars, um, which can be downloaded like the free Libra and stuff. And I think that's exciting to see if that's gonna make a difference in how we are able to control some of these chronic diseases. <laughs> Hello. Um, I think then if there are not any questions, we may be able to sum it up and um, be, we're all available by email. And so if at any point you guys want to communicate with us, if you can let us know, um, and we'll be glad to be able to provide, um, you know, information. And I think um, one of the best things that has happened for us with uh, our global health program is being able to go and see some of these interactions and be able to bring that back to our uh, practices here. And I think we're, our next step is going to be able to make that available to some of the uh, other countries to come and be able to see some of our models and successes we have had. Dr. Shailendra and Dr. Jamie, do you have any um, parting comments that you all want to? Yeah, uh, Shailendra here. So, Actually, this session was uh, a nice overview of uh, interventions leveraging technology and at the same time, uh, creating an environment for delivering comprehensive healthcare for chronic conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Uh, and the pandemic situation that we are going through has uh, actually challenged some of the pathways through which we deliver healthcare. And we are actually looking at uh, trying to resolve some of the issues that uh, came up during all three presentations here. That even though we leverage technology to make healthcare available to people, the challenge is the self-efficacy of the people and also the affordability of the people to be able to collect and generate healthcare data at their home. For example, someone measuring their blood pressure, blood sugar, and then being able to connect with a doctor remotely. Now that is a big challenge because though ours is a model where we are taking healthcare to the beneficiaries through the health workers and the technology, in a sense, it is limited because we were also not able to really reach out to our population and fulfill all the expectations of the people in terms of constantly being in touch with them and monitoring when they needed it most in terms of a pandemic. So we are actually trying to see if uh, there could be some out of the box solutions in future where we can uh, cut short uh, the limitations due to non-availability and non-affordability and also lack of efficacy on the participants about using technology effectively. So we have achieved something with uh, leveraging technology. We have increased the outreach of the trained doctor to the communities wherever it is not available. We have made it comfortable and affordable for the people, but still some challenges lie ahead in terms of uh, making it really remotely, seamlessly available and people fully enabled to take health in their hands and be weaned off from the facilitatory role that the health worker is currently playing to link them to a health facility. I think we are a little far from reaching that goal and hopefully some solutions from interactions in forums such as these may help us uh, inch closer towards it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think these are universal issues that, you know, as I said, they cross borders, boundaries, and, you know, we, we have the same population issues right here. Um, and so I think developing the ability to use technology and resources 
And I think the most important is empowering, teaching them the, the power of, you know, taking care of their own health and taking it in their hands. Um, there was a chat that I, I was really impressed upon. I think Dr. Jindal put it out there about educating the adolescents about NCDs. I think that's a phenomenal thing, even in the United States for us, because adults, you know, childhood obesity is increasing, diabetes rates are increasing, our ethnic populations are increasing. So I think it's so important to be able to empower the younger generation because they are the, the voice of tomorrow to be able to take care and take in charge. So I, I actually have that written out for one of my students to be able to do as a global project, because that's, I think, a phenomenal idea to be able to do a project with some of the high school students and be able to enable them to understand what NCDs mean for them, their family, their social networks, and their communities. So um, I, I, I really like that idea. Absolutely. Um, but I think it was a very interactive session and I'm so happy to be able to have presented this data from, you know, both from India as well as, you know, um, at least a start in, the, in Houston. And I'm hoping that we'll get this off ground soon. Um, but hopefully next year when we're there and we can meet in person and um, we can have the second follow up in these sessions with our data. So looking forward to that. And maybe now um, there were some questions about how do we get information on the participants. I have inclu included in the chat both Dr. Ibana included my email address as well as uh, um, um, her address. And then I don't know, Dr. Jami and Dr. Um, Shailendra, if you want to include your addresses or if somebody would like to interact with them, if you let me know. Um, and I could ask them and if they're okay, we can share the addresses. But I think the whole idea is that we start collaborating and we don't have to reinvent some of these cycles and gain from each other's knowledge and use it to the benefit of our patients and societies on a global platform. So um, we are looking forward to interactions if somebody is interested. I mean, I am a pure, I mean, clinician, so research is just a part of something that I do, but if somebody is an active researcher is ready to put in grants and stuff, we're more than happy. We have a nice global health center that we can coordinate it with. Um, so I think this is a great forum for us to be able to collaborate, interact, and move forward developing projects again across boundaries. Um, any comments, Dr. Jamie and Dr. Ibana? Otherwise, we can, um, you know, sort of close it. Yeah, nothing from my end. And I think uh, taking off from what you just said, uh, Share India also has this global health rotation program. We do get students and uh, uh, residents from Chicago, University of Pittsburgh, and a couple of other places. Uh, we would also be happy to, you know, sort of work with some of the faculty and other people to collaborate on doing some work. So we look forward for any interactions and collaborations as we move along. Thank you. Umi, do you have anything that you want to add? No, nothing to add. Just thank you for everyone's time. We really appreciate the opportunity to share to share this work with everyone. Thank you everyone for sharing your Saturday morning so that we could showcase our projects and looking forward to some collaborative efforts together. Thanks again, have a great rest of the afternoon and for my counterparts and colleagues in India, good night. Shubharatri, how they say. Uh, uh, all the houses they visit and then uh, note down the lats and longs for the household so that we have the geographical coordinates also. So Deepa, if you can just show reach video here, because that would give a good idea in terms of the, not, not just about the geocoded cohort, but overall intention in terms of how the reach moved ahead. Over to you, Deepa, if you can just okay. uh, show. So do you, let me see. Okay, let me get the screen here. Uh, hold on. I just stopped sharing, yeah. Yeah, okay. Let me see something here. And okay, there we go. So 
So let's look here. And do I say share screen? I, I don't think we're able to hear the audio for sure. Did you say you can't hear the audio? Yeah, I couldn't hear the audio. Let's see, because the audio says it's playing. Yeah, I think we are not able to hear the audio, but I audio. Okay. Let's see. Or should I just should I just try from our my end? Yeah, try from your end and see, and then if not, I'm gonna try to um, see again. So I'll stop sharing. To the mute and unmute button. Ah, okay. Can you hear now? No. So I think it's better no. with me. Um, Jamie, let me do some, I think I just got something. So let me share it one more time. Let me try this. Share screen. And share. And they said something, where is this button here? They said it's, there's a button which says share. So let me just see settings. Quality, subtitles, normal, so we've got that. I'm trying to see where this share button is. Uh, let me see. So when you initially share your screen after you button, you're gonna get that pop-up and that's where that share audio button is. So let me see if I can go back to this. And okay. There we go. So when I play it, open with, okay, let's just say, it doesn't offer me. Should be in the very, very bottom left. Because I don't see bottom left. No, screen. see, you're already sharing your screen. So if you stop sharing for just a okay. minute and then mm -hmm. start the share process over again. Okay, let me see. Let's see, here we go, this is just a minute and then I will, so that, and so now before I share, what do I do? Okay, <clears throat> give me just a second. I'm going to reset your share real quick. Um, do this and then okay so whenever you whenever i reset you and you hit share screen again it's going to pop you up a box that has your screens and okay. which program you would like to play from now on the very bottom left of pop-up there are two check boxes one says share sound one says optimize for video clip do not check the 
optimized for video clip, it's not properly working yet and it okay. actually messes up your video, but do check the share sound. So I'm gonna do this and take it from you for just a second. And then I'm going to stop. Thanks for your patience, everyone. We'll get this. Well, now mine is having issues. <laughs> Give me just a second, guys. I think this is actually, uh, Zoom might be having a hiccup real quick. Okay, so um, since I'm the host, it, what we need to do is um, basically reset the meeting room. So okay. you're all going to need to rejoin in about two minutes. Um, when I hit leave meeting, if you get booted, just rejoin pretty much immediately. I'm gonna reopen it right away and then we'll start okay. the process over. Okay. Okay, actually, here's what I'll do. I'm gonna get the option to, so I'm gonna make you the host while I exit and re-enter, okay? Okay. Are we still on? I think we're still on, Deepa. I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So if you will um, try again for me to so share, I do share screen. screen. Okay. okay. Now, when you, when you click on it, that first pop-up that comes up where you have your options for which window to share or anything. Uh-huh. There, look for those two check boxes in the bottom left of that first pop up before you actually start. Okay, sharing. so shared computer, got you. Okay. Yep. Now try and to then... share your video. Can you all hear it? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go back on mute and everything. Present system that there is no tracking of those who are not being served. We may know as a mass scale and say 50% are not served, but we don't know individually who is not served. But if we can go down to the very grassroots level and identify each individual in a timely fashion who is not served and make the local functionaries and their immediate supervisors aware of it, then I think that most of the people will be served. Uh, 
ever reach the rural effective affordable comprehensive health care is the motherboard for all our uh, service and research projects and the basic strategy is count every individual and therefore counting leads to accountability accountability leads to efficacy the reach project initially started with one village and uh, then slowly expanded to all the villages of Merchal Mandal, excluding the Merchal town. So it consists of 40 villages and about 50,000 population and 10,000 households. First, what we do is we take a picture of a Google Earth and to place it in the Google RGIS and superimpose the houses on each and every existing house which is there in the Google Earth. And we'll take the printout and go to the village and cross-check with the drawn map. If there is any existing house which has been not identified by Google Earth, we take that with the GPS coordinator device which is having with us and then place it in the ArcGIS. One uh, important uh, uh, manpower for this particular project is a community health volunteer uh, based in the respective villages one per every thousand population. The basic uh, uh, approach is the community health volunteers identify uh, women who, who become pregnant. During antenatal care, they, are, they receive uh, a TT injection. Uh, and subsequently, uh, when the birth takes place, the data about uh, the infant, the sex, whether it's like, I mean, where was it born, etc. All this information is collected. Every morning on Thursday, 11 o'clock, the meeting is conducted in the community room with the coordinator and health supervisors. The data is handed over to the health supervisors. They will cross-check the data and give it to the coordinator. And he will edit the uh, data and hand it over to the data entry operator. And the data entry operator enters the data. If she finds or he finds any problem, he will again return it back to the coordinator. The alert uh, report that you write uh, that tells you uh, which uh, household the child is uh, immunized, not immunized. Due to immunization. Yeah. Once you have it, you know, they give this to the CHU, and CHU will go and inform that uh, PSC, concerned PSC or sub center. And this is the household where this particular child, due to immunization, it has to be immunized. So once you inform those things, the concerned health functionary, they do the immunization. When it is not done for about uh, three weeks or so, when the particular child is not immunized, we take a vaccine from here. However, they start A and they don't give immunization. Then inform the government people that you are immunized. Because uh, they also given permission to give I think the most tangible effect is that almost uh, the vaccine preventable diseases are unheard of in this area. And two, I think it had some impact on the infant mortality rate that uh, the rural Andhra being around 55 and we have about 40. And three, even if you look at the under five mortality, it's even more uh, uh, impact because uh, there is a significant drop in the one to five mortality because of the vaccinations. So there you see much bigger impact. Thank you, Dr. Deepa. I think there were some issues. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for being patient on that. Uh, I just wanted to show you this video, which might actually give you a, a feel in terms of how the things happen. I'll go back to the presentation.
just give me a minute i'm just sharing the screen now uh yeah so this was about reach you know basically the geocoded database which we are following up for the past two decades specifically in terms of immunization maternal health and also in terms of family planning what we do in this database is every two weeks we ensure that we have uh, the information coming from each household if there has been any vital event when i say vital event vital event in terms of births we already get the information however if there is a vital event in terms of death in terms of migration in migration specifically which happens in this part of the country is after marriage the daughter in law comes to the house or after marriage the daughter goes out of that house so the getting that information is also critical so every uh, two weeks we have uh, we follow up and we get the information from each household so that the the database is updated every two weeks now this particular database is very critical because we are at any point in time with the surety of the last two weeks we are very clear in terms of what is the population residing in each household which is geocoded based on these uh, this motherboard of reach we have done various projects so i'll just sort of quickly go uh, take you through in terms of these projects the longitudinal indian family health study this particular uh, study was based out of the uh, one of the studies which was planned in united states the national children study for which i think they even had a congressional uh, approval of more than i think 2 billion dollars or something for the study however uh, the study couldn't be kicked off in united states for various reasons but we took that as one of the idea or a concept and replicated here in this study what we have done is we have enrolled couples especially couples who are planning for a child so we have enrolled pre pregnant women follow them up in the pre pregnancy period and during the pregnancy we again follow them up in the first and third trimester and post pregnancy we follow them up further in terms of delivery and also the child outcomes so the eldest child is now almost close to 8 to 9 years in this cohort we have enrolled around 1227 women uh, from this particular region itself the overall objectives were to assess the effect of prenatal and also pregnancy related factors uh, on the pregnancy outcomes childbirth and child development the current uh, uh, the intent of this cohort is to follow up the children at least for another 10 years or, or, or till the child is 18 years old to see in terms of what are the factors from pre pregnancy to pregnancy and how do they impact the child development and uh, child health under the life project under this longitudinal health and family health study what we have done is we also have uh, stored lot of bio specimens like we stored a uh, buffy coat and plasma of the mothers and then uh, during various stages in pre pregnancy early first trimester and also in the third trimester we also have stored the uh, cord blood placenta we have uh, the we have breast milk we have vaginal swabs we also have taken stool samples of uh, children and blood samples from children so there are close to around 100000 specimens bio specimens available in this particular cohort so as a part of this bio specimens we did a one ancillary study in terms of looking at mycoplasma and uroplasma species and how do they impact the uh, pregnancy outcome this was one of the uh, nih r21 that we had worked with uh, we got funding along with university of pittsburgh there's another uh, study or a cohort called healthy pregnancy or help study this is uh, based out of the medical college which is in the campus itself and uh, here what we are doing is we are trying to look at markers uh, which uh, are associated or which uh, are associated with uh, hypertensive disorders 
and in this study what we do is we look at uh, we uh, look at pregnant women who come to the medical college gynecology and obstetrics department we recruit women who are less than 14 weeks in their pregnancy and after that every month we do measure their blood pressures and also collect and store their blood samples so we have every month blood samples and every month blood uh, pressures uh, collected for these women over a period of 7 uh, to 8 months throughout their pregnancy so we have anywhere between 5 to 9 visits of uh, e of women who give their samples during this particular study and we are currently doing a cohort paper on this particular uh, help study we had initiated a cohort of geriatric population population is more than 60 years we took up 562 men and women uh, from this region again the database was very helpful especially reach database was very helpful because we had a line list of every uh, person who was more than 60 years and we had the gender differentiation also so we were able to do a random sampling and pick up the people from this the objective of this study was to look at the various prevalence of various uh, age related chronic diseases and also disability and my phd was on this study especially looking at uh, uh, bone density and disability associations we recently concluded a study wherein we looked at uh, surgical site infections among cesarean sections uh one of the things that i'm sure many of you would have observed or read or seen uh, in uh, news articles that in india cesarean sections are of a high proportion especially in andhra pradesh and telangana states the cesarean sections constitute almost close to 40 to 50% tamil nadu including uh so as a part of this we wanted to see in terms of so many cesarean sections are happening so what's the occurrence of surgical site infection so as a part of this study we recruited 2000 cesarean sections within the medical college hospital within our campus we followed them up for 28 days of four weeks of follow up uh, for occurrence of surgical site infection and uh, we just concluded the study and we are also we are in the process of uh, the manuscript writing for this the recent covid-19 pandemic i'm sure all of us have been really impacted by that if not we would have been talking in person in this particular conference so as a part of the work towards covid-19 uh, we initiated a serial a zero surveillance of covid-19 uh, along with covid-19 because dengue and chikungunya are almost i would say endemic or you know they become epidemic in certain seasons we wanted to look at the zero surveillance of these three particular viral diseases but for the covid-19 we are looking at around 5000 participants and we are going to uh, look at their uh, zero prevalence four times over a period of year in the months of 0 4 8 and 12 months and dengue and chikungunya we are going to look at 0 and 12 months so this is another study which we are doing it in this 50000 population of the reach database itself so these are some of the projects that are based out of the reach cohort or the reach uh, database that i was mentioning which is the motherboard for the activities many of the activities that we do at share india we also do as i was mentioning we also do other public health implementation and other uh, research related activities uh, one of the key things that we do in our organization is we work with uh, the government of india and provide technical assistance in various areas like hiv and tb care we also work in the lab space for providing technical assistance to the government specifically we are working on providing assistance for strengthening laboratory uh, processes and procedures for hiv related care especially viral loads and uh, cd4 testing we work in the space of infection prevention control and antimicrobial resistance we are also working in the space of uh, strengthening the surveillance system uh this has recently come in with the covid uh, pandemic and uh, the timely grant that we had received from centers for disease control atlanta we are trying to strengthen the surveillance systems especially in few select states we are also part of a consortium for testing uh, lab on wheels for chlamydia 
and uh, we are also one of the lead uh, consortium members for big data analytics on epidemiological data sets in India, for which we are contributing uh, data sets from the REACH, uh, LIFE study, and also the MILES, the geriatric study. So these are some of the other projects that we are doing. I just wanted to give an overall sort of uh, uh, scope of the work that we are currently doing in our uh, organization. This uh, technology enabled community health workers extending telemedicine to rural homes at affordable cost, which we also call it as Tetra, is one of the key M-Health related initiative over the last four to five years that we have taken. And I would request uh, Dr. Shailendra to take it over from here to explain in detail about this project. If there are any questions I'm willing to take, uh, however, I think uh, we can take it up at a later point, as uh, Dr. Deepa was mentioning. Over to you, Dr. Shailendra. So Dr. Jamie, I have a question for you. Do you want to see if anybody has any questions for this part of it that you did, or do you want to wait till the very end? Uh, I'm, I'm open, Dr. Deepa. Okay. Um, why I don't we do? A, huh, I, have a, I have a question. Um, the work we are doing in Gujarat the government has already mapped every village in a population of 65 million. And you have the demographics, the age, um, education, religion, everything. So it makes our work easy. And number two is, have you, you mentioned ASHA workers and we work with them because they're very motivated and <clears throat> they get fee for service and probably we should engage them more because some of the work you're doing overlaps with the ASHA workers or the Angarwadi workers in, at least in Gujarat. No, we, what we have done is that's a very apt question, uh, Dr. Rahul, uh, Dr. Jindal, but what I would like to put forth is that we have tried to ensure that there is no duplication. We ensure we only count those people who don't get service. Our intention is to reach out to the people who have not received the service and then link them up with the ASHA workers, AMs, and the Anganwadi workers for their services. So we don't directly provide service. We ensure that everybody receives services and we facilitate that part of it. So I agree that you know we uh, ASHAs are really very critical in the current uh, health systems. Uh, and we work very closely with them. And we only facilitate and help them do their work more efficiently by providing them the information. The second part, especially in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the Gujarat uh, mapping the complete uh, sort of 65 million population that you're mentioning. If that has been done, that is fantastic. However, if you look at uh, uh, the minute details in terms of household level mapping, and we call this as socio-demographic sites, especially in this country. We have only, as far as I, I am aware, around eight to 10 socio-demographic sites, which are uh, having minute details in terms of uh, geocoding and also the household composition, which is uh, updated. So the information of the 65 million, if it is there in Gujarat, that is fantastic if it is there, but I'm sure uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of that, but if it is there, then I think uh, that's a great thing for Gujarat to move ahead. It's on the internet. All you have to do is to Google Gujarat census and uh, all this will show up, um, including Google maps and, and very uh, focused minute information on every village. So- uh, No, I agree was, because- if you Dr. Rahul, uh, if you are mentioning about the census, we have it for all the states. We have it for all the states and all the uh, you know complete country. And there is information, as you rightly said, in terms of the village-wise, district-wise, sub-district-wise, that information is available, no doubts about it. But the only problem is in the village level, it only tells that you have 1,500 as a population. It gives you some description, uh, some uh, it gives you details about the gender distribution, some age category-wise distribution, and also in terms of uh, socio-demographic variables. But this information is done every 10 years once. And the updation of it is something that you know uh, is not done 
within the 10 years. And when you actually implement projects or implement interventions related to public health, uh, more recent information is what would be critical for planning. So that's the only reason why we went ahead and did this uh, thing. And I think we are one of the few people in this country right now having this uh, up-to-date uh, social demographic site. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jenny, there's another question in the chat about what software do you use to connect, to collect and analyze your data? Uh, the software is, uh, it's basically SQL at the back end and Visual Basic at the front end. And uh, most of the data is collected on paper-based formats because the community health volunteers are not much savvy at this point in time. Uh, in terms of doing a lot of data collection through a digital platform, which, but we do have experience now with Tetra project that they are capable of doing it. We have not a transition to electrical data collection, electronic data collection, but the whole data collection is done by a paper-based system, which is entered by data entry operators in our office. So it's visual basic front end, SQL backend. And I agree with Valerie when she says that Asha workers in Silchar, she has worked, they were amazing. I think, you know, Valerie, whenever you are in India, please do come to Hyderabad and reach out to us at SHARE. Uh, Asha workers across this country are really amazing. And in fact, there are so many great case studies that we have of them uh, in our locality that we work and also many other localities across this country. They have been Actually, they have lived up to the title, you know, accredited social health activists. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I, I think, yes, I, I do agree with you. They are amazing. Thank you. I have another question, a political question. Um, sure. The government of India doesn't like uh, funds coming from other countries, especially the US, because they are tied to ideology, religion, all sorts of things. So when will your project become self-sufficient? Like it's almost 10 years you have been doing this. When will you cut off the ties to US-based actors? Because that's what the ultimate aim is for all projects. Yeah, the if you look at the projects that I presented, REACH is self-funded. The life cohort is self-funded. But what we are actually having in terms of United States government funding is through the CDC, Centers for Disease Control funding, which is coming from since 2005. And we have not faced much of an issue in that front. Specifically to tell you honestly, we have had, you know, five, five-year fundings from CDC. We have had uh, two five-year funding from NIH and we had smaller R21s around two of them from NIH, which is from United States. And we never had any issues on that front. I don't think there has been uh, any issue at, at our organization specifically related to foreign funding. Uh, probably the processes that we follow and the things that we follow did not uh, you know, impact us at any point in time. At this, till now, that much I can say. Thank you. All right. Um, so since we have had a couple of questions, can we step to the next one with Dr. Shailendra? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. So just give him a second. I'll just share my screen. So I hope you are able to see my screen shared with you all. Yes. Yeah. So good morning to you all again. And uh, taking on from where Dr. Jamie left you all with the TETRA project, uh, which is an acronym for Technology Enabled Community Health Workers Extending Telemedicine to Rural Homes at Affordable Costs. So the image here in the inset actually is the uh, health workers visiting a household in a rural community 
the rural community where we have all of our projects running in the 40 villages of Maitchal with 50,000 population in India. So this TETRA project specifically focuses on hypertension and diabetes control. And why only hypertension and diabetes? Basically, we saw that uh, with uh, the intervention that we have been doing in the 50,000 villages, especially focused on maternal and child health, we were able to achieve a reasonably good target of immunizing the pregnant women and immunizing children. In fact, more than 95% target was achieved. And then we saw that the silent epidemic of cardiovascular disease has been sweeping the country. And the distinction between the urban and rural divides is gradually disappearing. And the urban population with increasing socio-demographic transition is becoming more vulnerable to the risk of hypertension, diabetes, and their consequences as much as their urban counterparts. And we thought that in addition to the focus that we have on maternal and child health, which are the old world problems, we need to also focus on the new world problems of socio-demographic transition in terms of the hypertension, diabetes, and the consequences of those in terms of the massive burden to life and economy of the individuals, families, and the nation also. Cardiovascular disease has now replaced most other conditions in India as the leading cause of death. And hypertension, diabetes are the two key drivers for this epidemic of cardiovascular diseases. Just to give a sense in terms of numbers, every third Indian is hypertensive and every tenth has diabetes. Unfortunately, only a tenth of the rural and a fifth of the urban Indian hypertensives have their blood pressure under control. Every stark reality and has potential implications for, again, the individuals, the family, and the nation, because hypertension uncontrolled can contribute significantly to morbidity and mortality. Again, to just look at some numbers, uncontrolled blood pressure could lead to 50% of heart failures. It could lead to close to 50% of strokes, crippling and sometimes life-threatening, and also affecting productivity significantly, and nearly 20% of the heart attacks or the myocardial infarctions are attributed directly to hypertension. So just taking care of hypertension, which seemingly is a low-hanging fruit and easy to detect and put people on treatment and follow up, seems to translate into reductions significantly in preventing heart failures, about half of them, myocardial infarctions, at least a fifth of them, and strokes, again, a half of them. So significant impact with a low hanging fruit for blood pressure detection and treatment, translating into benefits for the community and the nation is what prompted us to choose hypertension as one of the targets for our control. The other one, the twin brother of hypertension, I say the twin brother because nearly 30% of the people with hypertension have diabetes and a whopping 70% of people with diabetes have hypertension. So it would be very pragmatic to target both because when we target people with hypertension, we often end up people who have diabetes also, and it may not be ethical for us to say we treat only hypertension for diabetes, go elsewhere. And similarly, when we treat people with diabetes, identify people with diabetes, it will be improper for us to say we treat only diabetes for hypertension, go elsewhere. So we said that these are the two low hanging fruits and two key drivers of cardiovascular disease epidemic and have tremendous potential in making life better for the individuals, the families, and also overall for the nation's well-being. And this is what prompted us to choose hypertension and diabetes as the focus of our research by using technology. What does this technology do? The, we saw that only a small fraction of the people with hypertension and a fraction of people with diabetes have their blood pressure, blood sugar respectively under control. We looked up what are the barriers to the effective control of hypertension and diabetes. And from a scoping review of literature, we saw that the four A's, awareness, availability, accessibility, and affordability of healthcare were responsible for poor control of hypertension and diabetes. Hypertension and diabetes, we all know, chronic, insidious, slowly developing, progressive, and until late, people don't realize that they have hypertension and diabetes and end up with consequences like heart attacks, that is myocardial infarction, strokes, and heart failures. So lack of awareness, especially in a rural population, is a big factor that contributes to these diseases passing off silently until they pass, uh, then result in 
catastrophic consequences. So picking up early, creating awareness is an important aspect of hypertension and diabetes control over and above detecting and treating people with hypertension and diabetes. Additionally, lack of coordinated health care because hypertension and diabetes are problems for the life, at least as we see them today, though there is emerging evidence that we can reverse it, but by and large, we consider them to be diseases for the life. Now, if such type of condition requires continuous ongoing support and treatment over a period of time, and that system is well-oiled machinery to do that over a longitudinal period of time is currently lacking, at least in the Indian context, and probably many LMIC and uh, underserved populations even in the advanced countries. The other thing is being chronic conditions, people generally have a fatigue to medicines and the lifestyle interventions. So people may not be really enthusiastic and keen down the line after a few years, and they may not stick to medications and they may just have the blood pressures and blood sugars again, gradually trickling down towards worse. Finally, the direct and indirect costs, especially in a underserved resource poor setting, people need to spend money. In India, we don't have any big major health insurance applicable all over India. Of course, the Ayushman Bharat, as one of our colleagues was mentioning, is there in some states. But by and large, for conditions like hypertension and diabetes, for their management, visiting the hospital and getting treatment is really most of out-of-pocket expenditure, even if not directly, indirectly, because the person will have to lose wages on that particular day to visit the hospital. So we thought that this awareness being poor, the availability of healthcare being only sparse and not really well coordinated and available to handle the longitudinal nature of these problems, and also preventing the people from accessing healthcare because of a whole lot of socioeconomic reasons are the factors triggering the poor control for hypertension and diabetes. And what we thought was a non-physician health worker, as we all agreed, and there were a lot of comments that were posted in favor of the ASHAs, the accredited social health activists, and whoever has experience of working with them, you know, immediately, instantly connect. And I agree with the idea that they are exceptionally good in the work that they do. They are ambassadors for cheer in their own villages. And I would like to make a point here that the accredited social health activists were actually formally incorporated into the healthcare system of India under the National Rural Health Mission in the year 2005. But way before that, at least a decade before that, uh, you heard our chairman, Dr. P.S. Reddy, mentioning the idea of a health worker embedded in the village to facilitate the health-related activities in that village so that people own up the health care that is provided to them. We had conceived the community health worker or community health volunteer concept a decade in advance of the ASHA that was uh, incorporated into the health care system by the government authorities in India. In fact, most of the individuals that we have appointed as community health volunteers ended up being the ASHAs for the government and they are continuing to do the excellent work. So what we thought was these non-physician health workers, the community health workers, the ASHAs could be facilitators for enhancing community participation in the projects that we take up. They can be important ambassadors for creating awareness and motivating people to adopt healthy lifestyles and also to ensure adherence to medication. More importantly, they could be the critical bridge to enhance the utilization of healthcare services. People may or may not be really fully aware of the resources available to help them have access to healthcare. And the health workers, like non physician health workers, the community health volunteers, can bridge that gap in communication and help the hospital services be optimally utilized by these people. Finally, they could be leveraged by using technology, as we will go in a bit to deliver low cost healthcare at the doorsteps of beneficiaries. In fact, this concept of delivering healthcare at the doorsteps of beneficiaries is the brainchild of the founder of our organization, Dr. P.S. Reddy. He says, you justify me and give me 10 reasons to say why the patient should go to the hospital. He says, uh, there are many conditions that you could just treat even without the patient going to the hospital. And in India, we have a reasonably low doctor population ratio. Even now, if we say that the doctor population ratio is far better than what it used to be 50 years ago, still the argument is it's a skewed doctor-patient ratio. Most of our doctors are concentrated in the urban areas and doesn't look very encouraging that in the near future, they're any time going to go to the rural areas to serve. So given a lot of problems with the rural situation in India, most doctors would prefer staying back in the cities and work than to go to the villages. So making laws and forcing people may not really be a good idea. So how do we extend the arms of the physician, the physicians that are sitting in the cities 
how do we extend their arms and make them reach out to the people? Probably the extended arm of the physicians could be these non-physician health workers. And that is what is uh, the basis for conceiving this whole concept of the community health workers bridging the community and the health facility. And it's a two-way communication. People can go to the health worker, health worker will go to the people and then uh, build their trust and uh, rapport and facilitate their access to the healthcare. And on the other hand, whatever is happening in the healthcare system, which needs to be disseminated to the people and involve them and make them more active participants in seeking healthcare that is available to them as a right, can be uh, what called community health worker. So community health worker essentially bridges the gap between the needs of the community and the services that are on offer through the various agencies of the government. And this is what made us conceive the Tetra intervention strategy. In fact, just to give a background of how did this Tetra intervention strategy come up, we organized a research summit lasting about two days way back in 2013, early 2013. And the, uh, it was collaborative effort between the Public Health Foundation of India, the Center for Chronic Disease Control India, and a couple of universities in the US, like the Global Diabetes Research Center, Emory, then the School of Public Health, University of Pittsburgh, and we had few representatives from uh, Chicago and uh, also from the Northwestern University. And we had 60 leading cardiovascular researchers from all over India. And one of the important questions that came up as a part of the brainstorming was, can we develop and demonstrate a model for leveraging technology to deliver care for hypertension and diabetes in an effective and cost-effective manner? So I happened to be a participant in that meeting. And after that meeting, I was uh, asked if I could write up a concept note and submit it to the government of India, which I did. We got a uh, concept note approved. We got the full proposal also approved, but then the funding got significantly delayed. But our organization had tremendous amount of uh, uh, enthusiasm and positivity about this concept of leveraging technology and enabling health workers and sending them to serve people at the doorsteps for hypertension and diabetes control. And that is how we conceived this idea. And with some of our internal funding, we started off. I was fortunate to get a small grant from the NIH to do a pilot study, and this study kicked off. So we can see in the image here, there is a health worker. She has a bag. She has a tablet in her hand. It may not seem like a tablet, but that's a tablet device that we wanted to show here. And she's visiting a village uh, participant she measures the blood pressure, blood sugar, captures data on the tab. Then the data are all relayed to the doctor via cloud. And then the doctor can in real time see all the reports and prescribe a medication which can be printed out with a portable wireless printer that is available with the health worker. And in her bag, small bag that she carries, she has lots of material, which I will show you in a bit, and also has common medicines that are used for treatment of hypertension and diabetes. So this is what is a strategy that we conceived this is what it looked like when we wanted to go ahead with it. And I will show you how it really translated into reality and we achieved some encouraging success with it. So this is the health workers kit. Uh, here we have the weighing scale, we have the measuring tape, we get the BMI from the height and weight that we measure. The health worker is trained to do all of this. This is the tablet device. And these are all the paraphernalia associated with it to connect it with the glucometer and then to also connect it with the blood pressure device. One important aspect of our study is we do not allow the health worker the flexibility or option to enter manual data after measurement on an individual. This is all electronic data capture without any manual involvement. It's all automated data entry. We do not want any errors at the time of data entry to happen. And these are all the common medicines. And we took care to see that these medications are the medicines that are commonly given by the local health authorities because we wanted to transition the people that we have identified and put people on treatment to be able to get the medicines from the government someday. Because sustainability is by and large possible only at a massive level through the government support, at least in India at the moment. So we took care to see that the medicines that are to be given to people with hypertension, diabetes, will be something which will match with whatever the government is giving. Because when we transition these people to the government system, there will not be any uh, discrepancy or interruption in the medications that they get, both the, in terms of the pharmacological aspects of it or the physical aspects of it. And one question always arises in a community setting, how do we do the blood pressure measurement? Do we really have the health worker trained to do all the nitty gritties of measuring a blood pressure? 
in terms of the number of measurements, then taking care to see that it is really accurate and valid, how many measurements. We can't overwhelm a simple Asha with uh, a 10th grade educational qualification. She's already doing tremendous amount of work magnanimously with the low uh, amount of remuneration that she gets. We didn't want to overwhelm her with the complicated calculations that go into determining someone if they have a blood pressure elevated to qualify as hypertensive or not. So we took away that part of the intelligent uh, uh, commitment to work from the ASHA, lessened her mental burden and created an algorithm in the back end in our uh, tablet device. So when the blood pressures are measured, the tablet automatically prompts the health worker whether the person is flagged for further measurements for hypertension or the patient is non-hypertensive. For example, the blood pressure measurements, there is a complicated process given by AHA and also the European Society of Cardiology. They say at each visit measure multiple times and take average. For example, the ESC and the Canadian Heart Association, they say that take at least three measurements at each visit, discard the first one, average the two, second and third. So this part is all inbuilt into the tablet and which is connected via a USB cable to the blood pressure measuring device. And that is how the health worker just fulfills the requirement of connecting it to the participant and measuring at one minute intervals and rest of the task, whether the person is to be followed up subsequently for diagnosis of hypertension or not, and how many visits, if so, is all determined by the tablet. And if anyone has the first visit blood pressure after the three measurements as 180, 110, then the tab automatically shows this patient is hypertensive. There is a flagging that happens and an alert immediately goes to the doctor. And the doctor then also gets a prompt on his mobile to connect via Skype onto the tablet that is operated by the health worker, because this is a elevated blood pressure, very high blood pressure, and probably the patient might be in need of uh, urgent uh, attention to go to the hospital. So therefore, this type of inbuilt facilities are there, not to tax the health worker and uh, keep it very simple for them on the ground, still maintain accuracy and validity of blood pressure. So going to the doorstep of beneficiaries does not in any way compromise the quality, accuracy, and validity of the blood pressure measurements here. So we use for blood pressure diagnosis 180, 110 on the first visit itself of the three measurements. Or if someone is suspect, that is systolic greater than 140, diastolic greater than 90, but less than 180, 110 respectively, then the individual is prompted by the tab to be followed up second day and third day. And the visits are scheduled accordingly with the help of the prompt system that is their decision support system, which I may call on the tablet. So this decision support system is actually a support system for the health worker, doesn't really tax her. And this decision support system allows smooth functioning of the entire project. So that is how multiple measurements are made across visits and average across these visits is taken. We take average across three visits to confirm someone has hypertension, not to allow false labeling of hypertension. And we have calculated this and saw that if you end up diagnosing hypertension only with two measurements versus three measurements, the third measurement actually cuts down the number of hypertensives by a significant number. At least one in six individuals will be falsely labeled, falsely labeled with hypertension if we end up diagnosing with only two visits. And it will be uh, one individual less for every six individuals diagnosed if we include the third visit. Of course, it is a luxury if you can do three visits, but most guidelines say two or more visits. So that is what we followed and we use the three visits, not at all compromising on the quality of diagnosis of hypertension, though it is remote diagnosis of hypertension with the doctor sitting somewhere else. And for the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus, again, we use the point of care glucometer for the initial fasting blood sugars. Uh, and the fasting blood sugar threshold of above 125 was used to identify people. Then they were offered to undergo HbA1c and the HbA1c cutoff of 6.5 or more was used to diagnose people with diabetes. Again, this is a uh, reasonably robust way of identifying people with diabetes, though the gold standard would have been an oral glucose tolerance test, but then considering the large scale uh, uh, number of people that we need to do in a field setting, even in hospitals, people generally do not do a OGTT always to determine. And most guidelines say that you can use two methods for uh, independently different methods for diagnosing uh, diabetes. And that is what we use, the fasting blood sugar and an HbA1c. And we also did serum creatinine because hypertension, diabetes take their toll on kidney in addition to the heart and the brain. And picking up this can actually potentially prevent significant expenditure to the people in terms of going for repeated dialysis or renal transplant, and also sometimes risking their lives and losing a productive years of their life due to chronic kidney disease that could not be reversed. So creatinine 
Actinin is something which we do in people with hypertension and diabetes annually and do the EGFR estimation to see that people are tracked to assess their level of renal function. And at the earliest that the renal function is dipping and which needs care, we refer them to a nephrologist for treatment. So the intervention strategy that I showed was an illustrative image of what we conceived when we wanted to do it. And this is uh, the real uh, implementation image that is uh, displayed here. One of our health workers with a bag, with a tablet in her hand, visiting a home. And then there is one of these participants. She's capturing the data electronically. So this is a transition from our paper pen based method of data collection. So we moved to the electronic data capture. And we were a little skeptical initially whether the health workers will be able to do it or not, especially if the ASHA profile health workers, but they really rose up to the occasion. They built their competencies, we supported them, did handholding, and that is how they were able to do all of this. And then the blood pressure measurements, automated data entry that happens. And then the blood sugar measurements, again, automated data entry through the USB cable. And all of these data, including the serum creatinine data, we had a tie up with the laboratory that did the serum creatinine HbA1c for the samples that were transported to them. And we built up a backend mechanism between the lab and our hospital so that all this data, including the social demographics and the health related history parameters that are captured as part of the questionnaire, those as well as the blood pressure, blood sugar, creatinine, and any other medication the patient is taking, data become populated and are available to the doctor as a comprehensive electronic health record. So this is what actually is the real advantage to the doctor sitting somewhere. He has details even before he can talk to the patient. He has details of the patient's social demographics, past medical history. He has details of the medication that the person is using, if any. He has details of the blood pressures. He has details of the HbA1c. He has serum creatinine also. So that actually is a uh, reasonably robust way in which a doctor-patient interaction can happen. Uh, given the circumstances in which overcrowded clinics in India, ill-equipped clinics in India, and probably uh, not so well manned and well trained doctors being available in the rural area. So this is what we wanted to create as some sort of standardization for the healthcare for hypertension and diabetes, which is supported by digital technology and responsible health workers, both on the field and off the field. And the doctor's dashboard, as I said, prompts the doctor to decide what medicines to be given. And then the doctor delivers an electronic prescription in real time on the Upper right hand side, you see the portable printer on a chair and the health worker is printing out the doctor issued prescription right there at the point of care. And then on the basis of the prescription, the medicines are distributed by the health worker. She gives an appointment to the participant for the next follow up visit, which we did once in a month initially till the blood sugar sense, uh, blood pressure was stabilized and later it was three months. We did this project for about uh, four years. And we initially told the people that we will give the free medicines, but gradually we will connect you to health system and then uh, you will be transitioned to get the medicines from there. But we continue to follow up those people once in a month for their fasting blood sugars and blood pressures over and above what's happening to them through the healthcare system. So basically this is screening proactively people, providing them initial treatment, and then subsequently transferring them to the health system. So that is what we did in this project. And what were the features of the Tetra M Health tool that we use? By the way, I need to mention here that the Tetra M Health tool that we developed was on a Windows platform because back then, about four to five years ago, the Android platform was still evolving. And most of the devices, the blood pressure measuring device, the blood sugar measuring device, their drivers were not compatible easily with the Android software for automated data entry. And that was the only reason why we had to use a Windows platform, though it was actually not an open source and it is a little expensive, and we knew that tomorrow, if this model has to be scaled up, we will have issues. We said we need to demonstrate the concept as such, proof of principle and concept we need to generate. The software can anytime be changed depending on the feasibility. And that is what now we are at. We are now transitioning to uh, the software being done on an Android platform. So the previously existing platform, what all it could do was real-time data upload to a secure cloud text alerts to the physician, as I alluded to previously for teleconsult, generates electronic health records, reasonably robust. Otherwise in India, now what happens is people go to hospital, they get a slip of paper, the slip is gone and the patient doesn't know last time blood pressure, blood sugar, neither the medicines nor the values of mm, creatinine or anything else. So next time he goes again, everything is worked up. So it actually 
defeats the purpose of uh, chronic care continuum and that is what we thought that the care continuum can be uh, established through a digital mode and people can have a longitudinal care and uh, a evidence based decision process can be built into care for hypertension and diabetes longitudinally then it schedules the follow up visits for the health worker the health worker doesn't have to think last time when did i visit you when do i go so health worker gets updates on her tab like who is due the next day next week next month and she alerts those people well in advance and make sure that there is a mutually convenient time at which she can meet with them and have these measurements and then connect to the doctor if needed then we have also have an online digital and visual data analytics on our website uh, if time permits i'll just uh, take you to our website and show but of course that is passcode protected and that is basically from a monitoring evaluation surveillance perspective we can instantly track in each village how many hypertensives are there how many diabetics are there how many have they under control how many are not controlled how many participants the health worker visited on each day what is the level of adherence we use standardized medication adherence tools also to assess the adherence of these participants apart from the rest of the data that we get so we have almost instantaneous data available to us on the health workers performance as well as the quality of control of blood pressure and blood sugar of these participants this actually helps us to initiate remedial measures immediately once we know that in some village most people are not having blood pressure control or not having diabetes control so we can pinpoint those and uh, see what best can be done and people can be immediately connected to advanced level of healthcare beyond the telemedicine doctor to see if there is something that needs to be evaluated further to help the people get their blood pressure blood sugars and something else related to them under control currently tetra has screened 7000 individuals across six villages of course all these individuals are age 20 and above and then we have about 1600 individuals with hypertension and 600 with diabetes being followed up just to give uh, the numbers what is the yield of our tetra 40% for hypertension screening so 40% of the people who are unaware of their blood pressures yet were identified with the screening strategy that we use in tetra and uh, nearly a third of the people with diabetes who did not have a previous diagnosis known to them were identified mean reduction in systolic about 18 diastolic 15 mm and fasting blood sugar mean, mean reduction was about 26 mg percent and good thing was glycosylated hemoglobin before and after comparison 1% change of course this is not a randomized control trial but for an implementation project this is the best that we could put up before and after and blood pressure and blood sugar control achieved was overall 56% this includes both people with a past medical history and people newly detected by us and 34% among diabetics so considering the literature that says that blood pressure control is only 1/5th and 1/10th in rural and urban india so this is reasonably uh, uh, good uh, advanced achievements that we got in terms of the blood pressure specifically diabetics surprisingly world over it seems that people are not really going up beyond 30 35% because diabetes is much more than just i think blood sugar control and that we realize it only thing is we wanted to at least make sure that we identify people reach out to people put them on medication and the comprehensive care for diabetes can come in later so encouraged by the results of the tetra for hypertension and diabetes we knew that apart from hypertension diabetes when health worker goes there are a lot of people in the home and these people with hypertension diabetes also say that you know why do you only look at us for hypertension and diabetes there are many things that hurt us my joint pains my joints hurt me my cough hurts me my you know uh, uh, heart i have a problem i have a problem with my kidneys so if people who are not having hypertension and diabetes have some other problems and if the health worker says i'm sorry i cannot help you that looks a little uh, impractical and also unreal so therefore we said that if the health worker is already going to the homes of the people why don't we expand the concept of this with little additional costs can we include more screening can we include screening for age category wise specific conditions where we can screen and put them on treatment and that is actually the expanded tetra which we have completed uh, conceptualizing and also the software part is in the process of being designed on an android platform so apart from hypertension diabetes it includes conditions for example for pregnant women point of care blood pressure complete urine examination blood picture to identify if they were anemic and also motivate them to attend antenatal checkup the children about 6 years less than 6 years 
complete blood picture to pick up anemia then thyroid function because thyroid function is simple easy to identify the derangements and also has got tremendous consequences for developing children both physically and mentally so we didn't want children to have poor scholastic performance poor physical growth just because their thyroid was not good and no one picked it up so this is important aspect why we wanted to do the thyroid function of course the nutritional status by anthropometry and then immunization and mobilizing people for immunization if they are not immunized against the vaccine preventable diseases and all is anyway going on we continue with that and people between 6 to 9 all of the things that we do for children less than 6 but especially we screen for eye ear nose throat and skin diseases as well and for the adolescents we are planning for apart from the blood picture and the height and weight tsh again thyroid then skin ear nose throat eye diseases and also the blood pressure measurement in india we don't have blood sugars and blood pressure measurements on adolescents in a large way that's available to us no large data set has it so maybe we will try to get at least a semblance of it from the study that we are doing here so service with research is what our motto is and then for adults between 19 and 60 we have the blood sugars apart from the blood picture and blood pressure and then also the thyroid and ent people above 60 we also plan to get a ecg uh, point of care and also the creatinine estimation because people above 60 tend to really have uh, onset of the kidney disease and may progress silently and uh, picking it up early might have significant advantages so what do we want to do with all of this that we are doing is the goal is to digitize health information of all individuals at least in the 50000 population and create a prototype for the rest of india because countries across the globe are increasingly adopting technology and people want healthcare to be a part of the digital revolution and it will also help in customizing healthcare to generate finally a template for precision medicine for it has been too long now the medicine has been practiced on a mass scale approach one size fits all but then it's now gradually inching towards the goal of precision medicine and we want to actually lay the foundation for this by creating longitudinal health records that are digitally accessible available portable and also of global health standards for example we are working on not only collecting the data but also making it fire compatible that is fast health interoperable resource compatible so that it's on par with the global standards of uh, data functionality security and utility so that is what we envision digitizing health records and creating seamless portability for the people so democratic approach to healthcare data in the hands of the people about their own health they can choose the healthcare provider and they have a rich uh, treasure of background information about their health and suddenly someone falls sick people don't have to really worry about the sickness was contributed by something or another thing they know at least over a period of time what all factors might possibly contribute to the type of outcome what will be the prognosis and what treatment best suits that individual so i stop my overview of what we have done with the hypertension diabetes and what we plan to do with the expanded version of the tetra by taking healthcare to the homes of the people as far as possible not to say that you know we are uh, cutting off all the need to go to the hospital this is the first level of primary health care making availability and accessibility the fulcrum of our intervention and as and when required at the discretion of the doctor the health worker and the doctor can facilitate the people's access to health care so this is what i uh, wanted to share with you all and we are going strong with this uh, and in a few months once the covid situation improves a little bit further it's already on the improvement uh, trend in our geographic location possibly in few months we will go ahead with implement the expanded tetra also and hopefully next time when we meet we will have data even from that so looking forward to some interaction discussion comments and suggestions from improvement from you all and thank you all for a patient listening thank you uh, this is dr jindal again i have two comments um congratulations on the work you are doing uh, you must have seen on the box we have a similar project in gujarat called the sevakproject.org Uh, which we have been running for now 12 years and i've extended this to guyana in south america um so we cannot create or we cannot reach 1 million villages in india so what we have done is to create models so people can come and see what we are doing and then try and replicate that work elsewhere 
that's number one. Number, and we have a website and we have an annual conference, which I think you attended in, in Baroda in 2018. I think I was there at that time. And the second is um, in over 100,000 people we have surveyed, we found that the main problem was lack of education or awareness of Ayushman Bharat, where the primary health center, primary health care, the PHC, is doing a lot of the work, but the people are not going there. And now we are trying to understand with a qualitative survey of why people are not going there. Is it because they don't trust the government? Is it because there's a long line, wait, lack of follow-up, and so on? And we have been talking to the head of Ayushman Bharat, Mr. Javeri in New Delhi. Um, and he's very much interested is when the government of India has put millions and millions of dollars, there is an underutilization of services. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jindal, for, uh, you know, um, uh, appreciating our work and also um, enlightening us on the SEVAC project that you're doing. Yes, I happen to um, uh, go uh, through that type of work on uh, several publications that have been there and also through your website. And I have been myself associated with PHFI for my postdoctoral fellowship mentored mm -hmm. under Dr. Prabhakaran in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. So some of this work that we do is all to an extent inspired and also um, driven through the inputs that we get from Dr. Prabhakaran and Dr. Srinath Reddy from mm -hmm. BHFI. And if I can come in, I think Dr. Jindal, what you rightly said, especially with the Ashman Bharat, uh, with the clinics that has not seen the input from our, uh, you know, people coming to the clinics, there is now slowly a move towards population-based screening for non-communicable diseases which is being tested as a part of Aishman Bharat and also as a part of this non-communicable diseases clinics or health and wellness clinics. Uh, one of the states which is now trying it out is Tamil Nadu. I think other states will also come, uh, uh, surely, you know, will start doing that because they're, they're now the, uh, the move is towards going to the population and screening in the population. So, I think, yes, what you say is right, because there are a lot of this qualitative issues or barriers which the people feel in terms of reaching out to the clinic. I think that is being cut out now through population-based screening. Hopefully, things would function a bit better as we move along for a large scale of population in this country. Thank you. Dr. Shailendra, I just wanted to highlight some of the questions from our audience members starting with Valerie Fields, she wanted to know about the data you present on the results of the pilot Tetra project. Over what period of time did you achieve those blood pressure and glucose uh, controls that you indicated? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the uh, data that I showed was the current one, but the publication that we did for the initial two years of the pilot study and the results that we published initially are not very different from what I have shown today. And uh, about uh, two thirds of the people with their blood pressures and about one third of people with their blood sugars have it under control. And you know, each individual for the pilot data, we had followed up for about two years. So essentially you can say that it will be about one and a half to two years that it takes for people to achieve that type of a blood pressure control and a blood sugar control as well. Great. The next question is from Jessica Wilson. Wanted to know a little bit about community acceptance of the programs. Have there been challenges in this area? Right. The community acceptance for the blood pressure part was over 90% because it's a non-invasive process. But when we did the fasting blood sugars, it dipped to 80% because people didn't want in the villages even to be pricked on their finger for the blood sugar to be tested. And it further dipped to 70% when we wanted to draw 2 ml of venous blood for their HbA1c to be done. So for some things that's non-invasive, like blood pressure recording, more than 90% people are open to it. But when it comes to finger prick, about a 10% dropped off in our population at least. And then when we wanted a 2 ml venous draw from them for the HbA1c test to confirm a diagnosis of diabetes, a further 10% drop. So overall, it was about 70%. So people are very active. I'll share an interesting uh, anecdote. Initially, people were a little wary. They said, we don't want to get pricked. We don't want to get our blood sample tested. We don't have diabetes. Our families never had diabetes. So please go away. 
but when they saw people who were getting these tested where people were going to their homes and providing medicines and those people started having uh, a good feedback to the rest of the community then more people became motivated and they started coming in and started requesting can you please include us in the study but then we had a protocol which said that uh, you know we enroll participants only within a certain time period uh, from their first point of contact and though we unofficially did the study on them they could not figure in the list of the accepted participants so the list of accepted participants overall is about 70% but it's split across diabetes and hypertension hypertension little more participation 90% diabetes 70% Related <clears throat> related to that question about blood draw, how do you overcome it in children in particular? Yeah, that's why, you know, we have uh, taken only people 20 years and above because we were very sensitive to people in the villages being a little circumspect and concerned and anxious too. And rightly also for children to be drawn and also the yield of really identifying someone with the diabetes in children is too low. So the effort that we put in identifying someone with uh, diabetes by subjecting them to an invasive procedure, the yield is justifiable to the risk that we pose to them, at least a minor in terms of pricking for the blood sample, if they're 20 and above, but not less than 20, because the yield is too low. So we didn't focus on including them in our study. I guess for the expanded Tetra project, you'll have to come up with a plan to address that because you'll be enrolling a much younger uh, population. Right, we thought over it and even our IRB has actually sensitized to it. And, uh, you know, uh, we thought that for the complete blood picture part of it, if the child is cooperative and if the child gives an assent and the parent gives a consent and within the legal purview of the ethics and the IRB approval, we go ahead with the blood sample to be drawn. Otherwise, we just do the hematocrit by the WHO method where we just take a drop of blood and then uh, assess the hematocrit and divide the hematocrit by three to get the hemoglobin value. At least we diagnose anemia by that. But on another related note, I would like to say that Dr. Jami in his presentation mentioned about the zero surveillance for COVID that we are currently doing in 5,000 population at our site. And there we have participants two years and above, and we have been two months through the project. And it's very, very encouraging and heartening to note that parents have been very cooperative, children have been cooperative, and we have been able to draw blood from them. So that gives heart and also motivates us and makes us realize that you know, it's not that difficult if we convey to the people the benefit that is um, going to accrue to them over a period of time, probably through the rapport that we have and the health workers facilitating the process, we will be in a position to even draw the blood as and when needed to justify the uh, protocol and also to serve the people in need. Great. The next question is from Jeremy Short. Can you elaborate a little bit on the components of patient education and self-care in this Tetra project? Right, so we have developed the information education communication material, which we call the IEC. So the first level of information education happens through the community health worker, again, who is very well trained before they step into the field to do their work. So they are shown videos, they are uh, made to um, uh, talk to simulated individuals, and then they interact with the uh, PI and other experts in diabetes and hypertension. And once we are confident that these people have gained the competency to elicit the confidence of the people in communicating effectively about the hypertension and diabetes, they do it. I agree that that's not the sole focus of our intervention. Our intervention is primarily screening people and connecting to uh, the doctor for treatment. The softer part of hypertension diabetes management in terms of educating people and ensuring that they get efficacy, we are looking forward to people who are experts in lifestyle and behavior modification with well-defined concrete strategies which can be implemented in this population and that can actually help us achieve a better level of diabetes control especially and also improve our hypertension control with the twinning of the lifestyle and behavior changes in addition to the treatment that we do with the medications. So there is scope for improvement. If anyone has a concrete plan to engage with the diabetic and pre-diabetic population, hypertensive and the pre-hypertensive population with a diabetes prevention program or things like that, lifestyle modification programs, we will be very open to a collaboration and that can be implemented in this population. Just to add on to this, I say that we have 1700 people with hypertension diagnosed, but we have twice as many people with prehypertension who potentially will explode as hypertensives and a systematic evidence-based lifestyle modification program if implemented can show us some direction 
to see how we can delay the prehypertensives from becoming hypertensives and pre-diabetics from becoming diabetics. We look forward to some ideas, collaborations, and opportunities for working together on it. Can you speak a little bit uh, about how your program works with the India, the government of India's chronic disease prevention program? What are some of the, yeah, speak a little bit about how you link people into the healthcare system and also talk about maybe some similarities and differences between your approach and the, the government approach. Right, when we started this program way back in 2014, uh, the government of India did not have a system where the health workers visited homes of the participants, measured their blood pressure, blood sugar. And then we always knew that the biggest barrier is getting the people to the healthcare facility. So people would choose to ignore the silent conditions like hypertension and diabetes until it hurts them. And that is how we miss them early on when we could make a big impact. And therefore we choose this option of going to the people and picking up them much earlier than uh, what the health system usually does. Now, uh, the government is initiating population-based screening. At least in our state, there is a program that is designed and waiting to be implemented. Because of COVID, it could not be implemented. So they have now empowered the ASHAs and those ASHAs go to people's homes and measure the blood pressure, blood sugar but they don't really have the type of decision support system for a robust diagnosis of hypertension and diabetes at the moment. What we know they want to do is just measure the blood pressure, leave the blood pressure measurement to the health worker and blood sugar is just with a glucometer. And that is the only thing. They are primarily looking at people who already have a past medical history of hypertension and identify them and deliver the medicines at their doorsteps. But really identifying people who are not yet diagnosed with hypertension and diabetes in an accurate and valid manner to avoid all false positives and condemning people to medications for hypertension, diabetes with all the potential risks uh, is uh, not really well worked out from the way the government's plan at the moment looks. So there is where we offer to the government probably this type of a solution where we say we are free and uh, to share our uh, innovation and that can be used for uh, enabling the health workers to use accurate and valid measurements for confirming either hypertension or diabetes. Great. Can you elaborate a little bit about the ongoing training you provide to the community health workers and how do people in the community connect with this community health workers when they have emergencies? Right. So our community health volunteers or health workers have been there in the community since about uh, two decades. So they have a very good rapport with the people and they being from the same village, they gel with them very